Welcome everyone. This is Michael Gibbs and I'm the founder and CEO of GoCloud Architects and GoCloud Careers. And I am beyond excited to be with you here today. So today we are going to kick off our AWS Certified Solutions Architect Associate 2022 program. And I love doing these things. And if you're working on AWS Solution Architect Certification, or you're working on building a cloud architect career, or you're looking for AWS career ticks, tips, or solution architect careers, or cloud architect careers, we're gonna help you, and we're gonna have a lot of fun. So if you're preparing for that Certified Solution Architect Associate or that SAC-02 exam, we're gonna help you here. This is a complete AWS cloud computing full course, and realistically speaking, we're gonna start from the beginning and we're gonna work our way up. A little bit about me before we begin, right? My name is Michael Gibbs, and I'm the founder and CEO of Go Cloud Architects, which is the division of Go Cloud Careers, which I'm also the CEO of. And we help people get cloud hired. Most specifically, we take people, regardless of their background, and we help them get cloud hired. Now, when we looked around and we saw the types of certification materials that were out there, we were very saddened. And the reason we were very saddened is most of them told you the name of a service and how to configure it but they didn't really teach you how anything works. And if you're gonna be a cloud architect or a solution architect or an enterprise architect, you need to know how the systems work because if you don't know how they work, you can't design them. And I want every one of you to get cloud hired. So in this week, we're gonna have a ball. The way we're gonna run our training this, this week is gonna be as follows. I'll talk about something for a while, say maybe 20 minutes or so approximately, and then we'll have 10 minutes of questions or so because I wanna know that we answer as many of your questions as possible. On the far end of this for the entire week, we have Chris Johnson, he's my chief operating officer. He's gonna be collecting your comments, collecting the things that you say so he can bring them to me so we can ask, answer them. Now throughout this week, we're gonna be covering solution architect work, cloud, up, cloud architect work, and really it's about passing the AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate exam. So we want 2022 to be the best year for you ever. So this month, we have a lot of things that we're gonna do I wanna talk about in the housekeeping section, and then we're gonna get started. This month, we have a completely free AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate and Professional book. It's completely free. The link is in the description below. It is your companion book to this course. Please download it. It's completely free. It's almost 500 pages. It's got labs in there. It starts from the beginning and it's gonna get you everywhere you need. So I want you all to master the AWS Certified Solution Architects Associate in 2022 and get yourselves cloud certified. But most importantly, I want you all cloud hired. So I'm looking at you from all over the world. I see all parts of Africa, Pennsylvania. I see Turkey. I see all over Europe, Asia. How exciting. So we're gonna have a lot of fun with this. We're gonna have a really intense class. Now, during this class, if it becomes obvious that all of you out there are struggling with something and you're struggling with something bad, I might go out there and I'm going to go build a bonus section. And maybe I'll get people together one night and if they're struggling with IP addressing or something, we'll have an extra group because this is not just a static certification class. This is about making you a great cloud architect, a great solution architect. So you can have the best cloud architect career or solution architect career. So you know about the free book. In the end of this month, we're gonna do some free networking training. It's gonna look like a CCNA course. And here's why that matters. The cloud is a virtual network in the data center. You wanna design the system, you need to know the network in the data center. So we're gonna do that completely free towards the end of the month. Again, the links for all these things are in the description below. On Thursday this week, we're gonna have a party. Join us for the free How to Get Your First Cloud Architect Job webinar. And we will tell you everything you need to do to get hired. We'll tell you how to leverage your past experience regardless of what time, where, where it came from. We'll tell you exactly what hiring managers desire. And we're gonna tell you to get how to get hired, how to bypass HR when you don't have experience. So it's gonna be good experience for you. So please, it's free on Thursday. And next week, I thought that we really should teach you guys how to design an architecture too. So next week, we're gonna do a design and architecture session. And it's gonna be fun and it's gonna be live and you can ask questions. And again, I'm gonna run that completely free. Whoever had that beautiful orange cat, that orange tabby, it was a beautiful cat. It was great to see you. So now that you know what we're doing, let's actually start and begin. So everybody's ready to begin. Type hashtag cloud architect, and then I know you're here. And then after I see a hashtag cloud architect from all of you, 
Let's begin with our free AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate Bootcamp. So we'll, we may add to this bootcamp. We're going to do everything that we need to do to get you guys capable and qualified. So if you can all type Cloud Architect, I know you're here. There's 488 of you, so I'd like to see 488 Cloud Architects. Days across the street, I know you're excited and you're ready to go. And that's party time. After I see these Cloud Architects, it's let's go there. While you're at it, if you are not a subscriber to our channel, please subscribe and hit the bell notification. Here is the reason. We are going to be producing so much free content in the next month, and I want you all to take advantage of it. And the next few months, there's so much coming. So go out there, subscribe, hit the bell. If you're liking it, you know, leave a like. It's all good for the algorithms, and it keeps everybody happy. So party time. Let's go and have some fun. So let's begin with you know, the AWS cloud and how that AWS cloud is organized. So when we're looking at the AWS cloud, it can realistically look at it as one of the four potential areas. For the most part, we've got regions. And a regions is giant geography. Think a continent or a half of a continent. Huge, 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 huge area. That's what we call a region. Now, inside of these big global geographic areas, we have stuff like little mini data centers. They're called availability zones. So big, giant global region, data centers called an availability zone. Now, when we're talking about this, here's what we're going to notify you of. It, it, when we're dealing with the cloud, we're dealing with a lot of things. So if your systems are in your data center, guess what? They're real close to you, fast. If they're in the cloud and they're 1,000 miles away or 2,000 miles away, it takes time to get to them over the network. And even though we're using a fiber optic connection where the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second, there's latency and the latency can kill performance. So we've got regions, large geographic areas, local zones, or I'm sorry, availability zones, which are called data centers. And you know what else we have? Edge computing environments, meaning something in between us and our organization and the cloud. And I'm gonna show you graphically what this looks like in a minute, don't worry. So. Availability zone, a region, small data centers in the regions, availability zone, something attached to the region that's close to you, the user is called a local zone. And then we're going to talk about edge locations, and we're going to spend a lot more time on edge locations when we talk about content delivery networks and cloud from. But, you know, keep this in mind, you know, regions, large geographic areas, availability zones, data centers, and local zones, edge computing. And edge locations, content delivery network, and cloud front. So let's walk through a couple of these things so you can kind of see what it looks like. So bear with me one second. So in this particular environment, here's the cloud. See that big giant green box? That's a region. And AWS has multiple regions. All the cloud providers have multiple regions. And for the most part, they all call them regions, whether it's AWS or another cloud provider. And those little availability zones, which are inside there, they're just data centers. So big giant region, little data centers in the region. That's the way the cloud's organized. Now, that's great. But remember, if I leave my house in Palm Beach and I connect to the cloud that's sitting there over in you know Ohio, there's latency. So that's the concept of a local zone. What if I had a data center near me where I could put my computer stuff that isn't a thousand miles away? Well, that may save milliseconds of latency. So I want you guys to all think about this. Some applications can tolerate latency. If every one of you went to the gocloudcareers.com website right now and looked up our stuff, guess what? If it took an extra millisecond for you to get it, no one cares. Or how about a website, mycatcindy.com? I've got this beautiful cat named Cindy. She's got pointy little ears, pretty whiskers, a nice tail. And if I sent us all to mycatcindy.com, if it took you a millisecond or a thousandth of a second to get there, nobody cares. Now think of a bank that's processing trades in an algorithm environment where we basically place a trade. And if we can place that trade a nanosecond, not a millisecond, but a nanosecond faster than our competition, it's a massive competitive advantage. So realistically speaking, that's what we're talking about when we start talking about edge locations and, and local zones, is getting the content closer to you. So you don't have to wait for it. We humans won't detect the latency, but you know who will? Our systems. Big data environment doesn't like latency. Real-time trading applications doesn't like latency. 
Um, video doesn't like variations in leads. So, so keep that in mind. So now that we're going to talk about local zones, let's talk a little bit more about these local zones. So a local zone, quite frankly, is a place that you stick your stuff in between the cloud and your users. And I know the local zones are more of a certified solution architect professional than certified solution architect associate concept, but you need to know it as a cloud architect. And I'd rather give you more than less. So a local zone is an extension of the region, which enables you to run latency sensitive applications very close to the user. Basically, it's a midpoint. So if I connect to a data center that's 100 miles away, and then that's connected to AWS, I can connect locally and far away. And what's locally will have lower latency. So in AWS, you can use local zones if you basically want to do an edge computing environment. What happens, you opt into the local zones. And then you're going to create a subnet in your local zone. And inside of that subnet, that's where you're going to place your computing stuff, your EC2 instances, your load balancers, your containers, et cetera, et cetera. And certain local zones that AWS offers are really phenomenal. They can offer like file systems for Lustra, load balancers, math reduction, you know, caches, all kinds of great stuff, even dedicated hosts. So now you understand the concept. So let's look at what you know these local zones actually look like, because I want you to understand the full capacity of how this works. So normal environment, I've got this big giant geography called a region. Hey, continent, have a continent. Inside those availability zones are data centers. And what you see is going on here, these are the local zones. These are there. So what will happen is if, if, if you are sitting over here, which is directly outside of where this is, Let's say here's your data center or your premise. You connect to the local zone for your low latency stuff. And then you connect to the local, the availability zone in your region for the stuff that doesn't matter in terms of latency. So it's basically just a midpoint there. So let's go through it again. Region, large geographic area, because I want you all to remember it. Availability zone, data center within the region. Local zone, extension of the region to, to edge computing to give you the most performance. That's what the local zone is. Now, the next concept we're going to talk about with regards to the layout of the AWS cloud is something called an edge location. And we will spend massive amounts of time talking about content delivery networks, how they work, why they work, why they benefit the customers, because these things are very important. But for right now, we're going to use an edge location. And we're going to talk about using content delivery networks. So what happens is when you want to go to a website, for example, we can use something called the content delivery network. And I'm going to show you how that works. But the point is, a content delivery network speeds content to your users. It effectively provides local access in many major cities. It's going to reduce perform, it's going to increase performance and reduce latency. And it's going to get your traffic off of the internet. So when people talk about content delivery networks, they often forget to talk about the network piece. But guess what? That network piece is just so critical. So I'll show you how they work. But an edge location is the, where CloudFront's content delivery network works. So I'm going to show you in two ways how it actually works. Let me first show you the, what it's going to look like over here. So if you can see, we've got our regions, big geography, our data centers called availability zones, and then we have these edge locations. Now, these edge locations are where you're going to access the content delivery network. So let me show you what it looks like. Here I am, I'm the user. I'm sitting in here, I'm the top user. And I want to go to www.gocloudcareers.com. So what do I do? I enter www.gocloudcareers.com. First thing that happens, my computer says, I need to find the IP address for gocloudcareers.com. So my computer does a DNS lookup and says, who has the IP address for gocloudcareers.com? And then DNS gets a response. So now what I do, I go to the local place. Now, if we're using a content delivery network, what you're going to find is the user is going to request it. It's going to go to the edge location. And if it's on the edge location, it'll work. OK, so let's explain the content delivery network. Here I am. I'm me. I'm Mike Gibbs. I want to go to www.gocloudcareers.com. I now enter that on my computer. I find the IP address. The IP address that I get is actually the IP address of the edge location. So when I'm entering my things in my browser, I'm all kinds of happy. I get the IP address of the CloudFront edge location. I go to the local edge location. Now, if somebody 
previously that same day or before the cash timed out said went to the www.gocollectcareers.com i'm just going to go to the edge location and it's going to smile and say got it for you mike edge location got it for you mike and let's say i'm using us east which is a thousand miles away but the edge location is in miami and i live in palm beach guess what I hit the Miami Edge location to get my website as fast, as big, as beautiful. It's great because it was stored there. So now what happens, for example, if we're using an Edge location and we're using a content delivery network and it's not there. So here I am. I go to www.gocloudcareers.com and I, go, I get sent to the Edge location. Let's pretend the Edge location doesn't have it. What will happen is that request will be sent over the Amazon's private content delivery network, CloudFront, and the request will go to a regional cache, which will then go to the data center, meaning our VPC or where our stuff is. The systems will respond. They will drop it off at the regional cache, which I didn't show here, which will drop it off at the edge location. And now my wife, Lisa, wants to go to www.gocloudcareers.com. She hits it here goes to the edge location, the edge location says, I have it because Mike's there. Then my cat, Cindy, who's like the mouse hunter, the rat hunter, the rabbit hunter, the snake hunter, she decides that she wants to go to www.mycatcindy.com to look at some pictures. Now, when she goes to www.cindythecat.com, she's not over here. So she sends the request to the edge location, the edge location says, oh, I'm gonna go to the server, I don't have it. So now there's over here. So now it's at the edge location and now it gets back sent back to Cindy and she's happy. Now I want to go see what my cat's doing on the internet. So I go to www.mycatcindy.com because my cat Cindy does all kinds of stuff. So now I go request it and I hit the edge location and it's already there because my cat, who's really good at unplugging servers, chewing ethernet cables and damaging my OpenStack cloud that sits in my house, you know, it's already sent to me. Now my wife wants to see what the cat's doing. She hits the edge location that's already sent to her. So that's kind of what we try and talk about. So that's why we do what we do, how we do it, why we do it. And that's why we're using content delivery networks to reduce latency, to speed performance and reduce load on the servers. Now, we're gonna get into the virtual private cloud. We're gonna do a very, very, we're, we're gonna talk very briefly about the VPC for about two minutes. Then we'll talk about different variations of cloud architectures and the strengths and weaknesses and, your, and their approach. But before we do that, do any of you have any questions on any of the materials we covered so far? I want this to be like a real classroom where you ask questions and we answer them so everybody gets a good experience. So if there's any questions, we can take some uh, questions. Uh, we can we can take some questions. Chris from my team is gonna aggregate them because we've got lots and lots of people. So we'll do the following. We'll answer as many of the common questions as we can. If there's too many questions, we may hold an extra meeting to actually answer some of the questions, but we'll answer as many as we can while keeping the flow of the course. So if you can kind of work with us on that. So Chris, um, do we have any questions from the first few minutes of class? All right, Mike, so I'm going to do this this way. Uh, I'm gonna read them out just okay. because the, the pure volume of them. Uh, so we have a so couple that Read out are, one and then I'll yeah. answer it and then read out the next one. Unless yeah, there's so, three or four that are the same. Exactly. That's that's why I'm going to read them out because there's okay. three or four that are the same. Um, <laughs> what is, um, let's see, is local zone the same as edge location? Okay. So no, they're completely different. The local zone is a place that's close to use for edge computing. That's where you put your server. The, what do I call the other one? What's the other one? Uh, what do you call it? Edge location. So uh, the edge location is actually where CloudFront are. Now you would think that they would call an edge location um, where you do your edge computing, but it's actually reversed. Edge locations are exclusively for the CloudFront content delivery network. And we will talk a lot about the CloudFront content delivery network much more for probably two hours one of the days this week because it's so essential. But uh, local zones are designed for edge computing and uh, edge locations, despite the goofy name, are designed for actually content delivery networks. Yeah, and Chris, so that, you want to bring in the next one? Yeah, so that, that was the biggest one. <laughs> so okay. that's why I put that one first. Okay. Um, the next one, uh, and also some of these may be coming before we cover them in depth. So you know, quite you can, possibly you can, you can say that as well. 
Uh, I guess local zone works like rented cash. Is that right? Not at all. Okay. So let's do this. Let's let's draw a little map real quick because um, I think this is a really great question. So let's uh, put a new slide in here. Yeah, hold on, let's not do that. New slide. Okay, here we go. So let's look at it this way. So let's let's assume here you're the user and over here, we've got our happy, happy duty on-premises environment. Now, let's say over here, we've got our cloud. Can you uh, share for us? I'm not sharing? Oh, so, yeah, let me figure out how to do this. No, it should be shared. Oh, wait, no, okay, never mind. I see what, I see what you're saying, Chris. Okay, so let's say we set up our on-premises environment. And we've got our cloud. Let's today, for argument's sake, call it the AWS cloud. The reality is most architectures we design have multiple clouds, but it doesn't matter. For right now, we've got multiple clouds. Now we're gonna want we're gonna want some degree of availability in our AWS cloud. So let's say for our AWS cloud, let's make sure there's no problem. So let's say we've got two availability zones, two data centers, AZ1, AZ2. The hope by doing this is if one AWS data center fails. You'll be able to fail over to another data center, which can work in some cases, but not others. So typically what would happen is you would have, say, a direct connection or a private line, and you'd have a VPN backup to these environments. But what if this is 1,000 miles away? This could be 1,000 miles. What if it's 2,000 kilometers? There's latency across that wire. So what you have is you have something called edge computing, and basically, like when you connect to a direct location like Hannah and Center, and we're going to show this. So let's say this is going to be a local zone. And the local zone is going to be in your state or your geography. So let's say this is in Miami. Let's say my on-premise is Palm Beach, Florida. And let's say the closest place that I can get to is on the AWS environment is Ohio. Now, from Palm Beach to Ohio takes a lot of time. But from Palm Beach to Miami takes almost no time. So if I have some special high performance computing environment, I'll connect to this local zone, which is gonna be close. It's basically gonna be somebody else's data center, a managed data center, basically a cloud that, that's close to me. And then that local zone is then connected to the AWS cloud for the main stuff. So I put my low latency stuff, I'm gonna call it stuff because there's a lot of things, low latency, and I'm gonna put that in the edge and then I'm gonna put my standard latency things over here in the cloud. And by doing this, what we can do, so it wasn't supposed to happen, is by doing this, what we can occur, we can do is we can pretty much make sure that we can get to the stuff that we need in the low latency environment and still use the cloud for the high latency environment. I hope that made sense to everybody. Chris, if you wanna bring in the next one. So the next uh, couple are related to Route 53. I don't know if you want to address that now or if you want to wait till we cover Route 53. We're going to um, be covering Route 53 in depth. So I yeah. want to make sure that we stay on track, on purpose. Um, yeah. We'll be spending a good hour or two on Route 53 when the time is right. All right. Uh, how long is the content available on edge locations? And can we manage how long it will be there? Yes, you can manage how long it's going to be there. If it's a server, it can be there permanently. Oh, wait, um, oh, for edge locations for CloudFront. So when you're dealing with a CloudFront, you're dealing with a content delivery network. You can really tune how long it stays there. Here's the thing. You could have it there for weeks at a time if you wanted, but here if you did, every time you'd make a change to your website, nobody would know about it for weeks. You could make it minutes if you wanted, but if you made it minutes, guess what? Um, the cache wouldn't be doing you that much, but that's all adjusted by the time to live, and that's definitely something you can do on a CloudFront content delivery network, and we'll talk about that in depth in depth um, for the edge locations. But for local zones, the regular data centers, you can put anything you want on them, they're not caches. Good All question. Right. Uh, how does the website get updated on the edge location? It's just a cache. So if we go reach out to the edge location and it's stored there, it's gonna send it to us, but the cache will time out. There's a TTL. So if we set the TTL for two minutes, that cache will be refreshed. Every, every two minutes, we're going to request new information. The cache will pull new information. 
but if the TTL is forever, it'll stay there. So let's go, let's go back to this, this, this diagram real quick one more time. So here's how the CDN works. And again, we're going to cover the CDN for hours. So I don't want to get bogged down too much in the CDN, but it's an important concept. So you've got a user. They go to a web page. The web page is not there. The web page is requested to a regional cache, which is sent to the source. The source comes back, populates the regional cache, populates the edge location, and then sends it to the user. Now, if somebody goes back five minutes later, it's there. Now, if the TTL is for 24 hours, this content is active for 24 hours. If the TTL expires in two minutes, after two minutes, I go to this content, it's no longer cached. So after two minutes, if the TTL is two minutes, I go here. It then sends, it's not here, it sends the request to the regional cache, it's not there, it sends it to the source, who sends it to regional cache, who sends it to edge location in here, back to me. Now, if, I, if me or somebody else requests that same page within two minutes, they'll get it refreshed. But if it's been longer than two minutes, it's gonna, the TTL will expire and it'll go from the user to the edge location, it won't be there anymore, it'll go to the regional cache, it won't be there anymore, it'll go to the source, but we'll then repopulate the regional cache, the uh, edge location and send it back to you. So that's kind of how that works. It works based upon the time to live. It automatically gets updated by you, the user. All right. Um, so, let's see. Um, is the local zone uh, a data center, and is it owned by AWS, or is it private? It's a data center that's owned by AWS. Okay. And that's why we're describing it, which is a good question under the AWS cloud and how the AWS cloud is organized. And does it contain all of the infrastructure yeah. as the availability? And, re and remember the locals, those local zones are brand new. So they don't have all the features and functionalities of the full AWS environment in the traditional availability zone. Some have more features and functionalities like others. That's why we mentioned the one in LA has a lot versus the standard one. Are there any others that are related to the content that we're actually talking about now? I mean, I can see stuff that we'll cover in the database section, and I can see stuff that's related to part towards the end of the course, but is there anything related to the content we're talking about now? Um, I Because, I, for example, I see a question, which I answered a second ago, came in twice. No, local zones do not have all the functionality of the AWS availability zone. They have a subset of that functionality. Any others? So I want to make sure we cover it before we go to the next content. Okay, so I think what we should do is move forward. Before we move forward, if you're having a good time, please hit the like button. Please uh, comment. Please subscribe um, to make sure that you don't miss out on anything. We have a lot of free content. Please make sure that you download the free AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate and Professional Books. Use that along with this class. It's part of the package. It has everything you need in there. It even includes a practice test. So make sure you get that book. Make sure you get that lab. By the way, we're going to be covering the architectural concepts on this because we're doing it as an architecture program. In the end, we will release some videos and some labs, but I want to teach you the stuff, how it works, because architects build, architects design, engineers build. As architects, we don't configure, but as engineers, they do. So we're going to have that engineering stuff coming later in the week because it's on your exam, but also we want you to know how to do it. But it's just we're going to keep this architecture focused. So let's just talk about, you know, the three main kinds of cloud architectures you can have and what are the benefits of each. So we have three kinds of cloud architecture. And they're the hybrid cloud, they're the full cloud, there's the multi-cloud. And each one of these has their strengths and weaknesses. The hybrid cloud may be the best environment ever, and it offers the best performance to your customer. The hybrid cloud is quite simply, you take your data center, which is, offers the best performance anywhere, and you connect that data center to the cloud. And you run all your low latency applications in your data center, because your data center is faster than the edge, it's already there. So 
hybrid cloud. You take your data center and guess what? You connect it to a single cloud and it's gonna look like something like this. Realistically speaking, it'll look uh, something like this environment. We've got a nice data center. We've got our direct connections. And then, you know, that will be going into our cloud. And this is really great because we've got the cloud doing what the cloud's good at. Agility, scalability beyond belief. Business agility, it's amazing. And then we have the data center over here doing the high performance computing. The data center is much faster than the cloud. Lower latency. So we don't even need the local zone. If we use a hybrid cloud, local zones are a waste of time because we have the high performance in our data center and we use the cloud. Let's talk about why hybrid clouds are so good. Let's say an organization already has $100 million of technology. Why not use it? Why not? And you know what? Next week, we're going to have a free cloud architect design experience webinar. I may teach half of you guys how to build your own clouds, or at least we'll talk about building the private cloud. So all my students in the cloud architect and career development program build their own clouds. And guess what? I suggest all of you build a cloud too. Buy yourself a server with 16 cores, 120 gigs of RAM, three SSD drives. All my students do make a cloud architect. But... Hybrid cloud, data center plus cloud. Most high performance, most available, perfect system. Now, next solution, pure cloud. Now, why would you ever wanna just connect to a single cloud provider? Well, I recommend never, but a pure cloud environment is quite simple. You've got nothing there. And you call AWS or Azure or Google and you say, I wanna be, and you order your VPC, you order your services. So the pure cloud is good for a startup, like somebody small, because it's fast, you can deploy it, but here's the problem. A single cloud is a single point of failure. And you know we'll tell you according to AWS, how to make high availability in a single cloud provider, but a single cloud is a single point of failure. Only three customers are willing, 3% of customers are willing to do a single cloud now. Why? Because if you've got a network failure on the cloud, all the availability zones and regions all go down. The cloud has a hacking event, it can take down the entire cloud and if something goes wrong with the control plan, it can. We've seen this. We saw AWS have multiple problems in multiple availability zones and regions. Why? You can't deal with a bad network. So a single cloud is a single point of failure. So when should you use a pure cloud on a single cloud provider? I'd say never. But if you're dealing with a small business or you're making a website for my cat Cindy, you can stick it on a cloud provider. Now, what is the next cloud architecture, the kind that we would tip? And, and what does a single cloud, archi cloud architecture look like? It looks like this. You've got your organization, you've got your direct connection, and then we're using a couple of availability zones, and that can give you moderate performance and moderate high availability. Now, what's the real way to do it? If you really wanna make it work, connect your data center to the Azure cloud, the Google cloud, and the AWS cloud, or the AWS cloud and the Oracle cloud, or the Google cloud and the Azure cloud. It doesn't matter when you use there's a saying when it comes to building high availability, high performance networks and systems. One is none, two is one, and three is greater than two. So diversify, diversify. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, whether it be all your money in a single stock or all your architecture in a single cloud provider. It's just too dangerous. So just wanted to go through those architectures, what and why we're using them. So now let's talk about the cloud. If you're gonna put your stuff on the cloud, you gotta be able to reach it, right? If your services are on the cloud, how do you reach them? You need to reach them through your network. So the network is the plumbing that makes everything, everything work together. The network is the plumbing. So the network or your connections to the cloud are critical. Let's say, for example, you have a hospital and they decided to use three cloud providers and they didn't have their own data center and their links to the network went down. Guess what? They've got nothing. So it's all about your, your wherever you're gonna put it and your networking, your connections. If you've got no network, you've got nothing. So keep that in mind. So let's talk about connecting to the cloud. There's realistically speaking, two ways you can do it. And we're gonna talk about both ways. I'm first gonna start with VPNs, which the reality is are not gonna be good enough for most environments. A VPN or a virtual private network is a means to actually, to actually encrypt your data over a public internet. So we're gonna have two ways that we connect to AWS, well, actually three. We can use software divine networking, which goes through the internet, but we're not gonna talk about that because that is way, way, way outside that scope. And it's for the CCIs like me. So the next option is we buy a private line to AWS. 
AWS calls that private line and direct connection. We'll talk about what, when, and how, and why that works. But we can also create an IPsec tunnel or a virtual private network across the internet. We can tunnel things across the internet and create privacy amongst the public network. Hey, wait, do you know what the cloud is? A public network for which they carve you out something private. Hmm. Where do you think this came from? It came from networking 30 to 40 years ago. In fact, if I tell you that every brand new cloud service was a networking service from 30 to 40 years ago, you'll know why networking people like me work at all the cloud providers so fast. So let's talk about a VPN. A VPN is where you take a public network like the internet and you send your stuff through it in a manner that no one else can see it. So why do we have to use VPNs when we're using the internet? Well, we're going to be using private IP addresses in our data center. And if we're using private IP addresses, they can't be seen on the public internet. So we're going to have to stick them in a tunnel, whether it be a GRE tunnel or an IPsec tunnel or an SSL tunnel. Option two. So there's that. Two, we need to make sure that our information can't be compromised. So that's a big problem. So because of that, we need to use something. So we're going to use something called IPsec. And we'll talk about why organizations use IPsec, why it is the exclusive and best form of VPN trap tunneling over the internet, and how it works. But I just also want you to know, there are lots of, lots of VPN technologies. IPsec, L2TP, MPLS-based VPNs, like as defined in RFC 2547, VPLS, there's lots of it. Frame Relay was a VPN. Frame Relay was the first cloud that I worked on, and it was in 1997. Then I worked on the ATM cloud, which was another pri virtual private network in 1999. Then the BGP VPN, RFC 2547, I worked in that around 2000, that cloud. And then uh, beyond that, I worked on the VPLS cloud, um, before I started working on these clouds and that stuff was, my God, we're going back a long, long, long time. VPLS was, wow, um, 2001 or 2002. So lots of VPN technologies. But the point is you can't send your data over the internet. It's not secure. So kind of keep that in mind. Now, we want to be able to pass routing information. We need a VPN because we need both sides to be on the subnet. So that's why we're using with VPNs. We can't just have two IP addresses on the far end and do routing across them. That's why we're using tunnels. So what's a VPN look like? Well, it's gonna look like this. When you really think about it, you're gonna have your users that have a, have a data center. You've got to have your data center. You're gonna have a cloud providers and there's gonna be a router over here. And that router is gonna be encrypting and tunneling your data back and forth to AWS. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So by tunneling it, we can use private IP addresses, we can pass our routing information, and we can have the same the su same subnet on both sides. We need that for routing. So let's talk a little bit about IPsec VPNs. IPsec is not just encryption. IPsec is a full security protocol suite, and it's awesome. When I first started working with IPsec back in 2000, I thought it was cool then. And you know what, 20 some years later, I think IPsec is even cooler now. So IPsec lets you tunnel your traffic and encrypts your traffic, but it does more than that. There's a really nasty kind of security attack called man in the middle. So I'm looking at one of the names that's here. Eva Doikia there is there and Abigail Marks there. So let's say we've got Eva Doikia over there in Hungary. I don't even know she's from uh, Bulgaria. And we've got uh, Abigail who's sitting somewhere around Virginia, DC, Virginia, United States, somewhere in there. And these two are talking. Now, if uh, Eva Doikia and Abigail want to talk about stuff and they're best friends or good friends and they're talking to each other, this is good. They're talking about things, whatever it is. Now, let's say I decided to pretend to be Abigail and Eva Doikia is telling me things. What, but I'm not Abigail, but Eva Doikia thinks I'm Abigail. Well, Eva Dyke may tell me things that she doesn't like Mike to know, and this would be bad. That's called the man in the middle attack. So IPsec does the following. Identity verification of the peers. So there's no man in the middle attack. Abigail is Abigail, and Eva Doikia is Eva Doikia, and there's no way that anybody else can pretend to be. IPsec provides that. So that's called authentication. IPsec also uses a hashing algorithm. So if I send a message to Eva Doikia, Eva Doike can check the hash and see that message hasn't changed. So I want you to think about this. Let's say I'm in a hospital and I write a prescription for two milligrams of morphine because the patient's having a heart attack. That's fine. 
Now, what if somebody changes that two milligrams to morphine to 200 milligrams of morphine? That person will overdose and die. So I need to be able to ensure that the message integrity is stayed. What if I tried to send somebody a wire transfer for 100 bucks, but sent a million along the way? That would be a problem, right? So authentication of the peer provided by IPsec, and it can verify that the messages haven't changed. The last part of IPsec is it provides something called non-repudiation. So for the lawyers out there, here's what it means. It means once you've sent something, you can't say you didn't send it. It's sequenced. There's a sequence number. There's, there's numbers. So IPsec not only secures your traffic by encryption, but it makes sure you're talking to who you talk to. It's making sure the messages haven't been changed, and it's making sure that you can't say after the fact that it happened. Wait, IPsec was the blockchain of 1999. Because that's what you're getting at a blockchain in you know, 2010. 2015, this is pre-blockchain. See, there are no new inventions in technology. There's just rehashing of the same thing. So that's let's talk. So let's talk about what's great about VPNs. Cheap. As a rule, internet connections are everywhere. It's ubiquitous. Internet connections. So for the cloud architect or the solution architect, they've got an internet connection on both sides. All they need is a router and they make a nice piece of tunnel. Bob's your uncle. Poof. You've got connections to the cloud. Easy go. Easy deck. Now, what's the problem? Well, it, you're riding the public internet, right? Is there any guarantee of performance over the public internet? None, none whatsoever. So by doing this, you can realistically expect your performance is not gonna be that great. But internet access is everywhere, so it's quick to set up. And if I had a big pipe on my internet connection, I could create a multi-point VPN. I can connect to New York, London, San Francisco, Lagos, Johannesburg, um, Hong Kong, and Sydney, all at the same time, because I can just create IPsec tunnels. It's the greatest thing ever. So easy to use, can be set up in minutes versus the time it takes to get a private line. But internet performance is not guaranteed. So there's no guarantee your data is going to be passed through. There's no guarantee that your, your latency is going to be the same. It's expected you'll get variation in latency. You may have packet loss. So VPNs are used when it doesn't matter. They're used basically if you, for things that are not critical. They're used when you're not sending a lot of data. Perfect for a small office. Perfect for a Starbucks office connecting to the main environment. If the internet's down and somebody can't get their coffee for two minutes, nobody dies. It's perfect. But if you've got a hospital connecting to the cloud, they need a private line because they need guaranteed performance. So keep that in mind as we're doing these things. I just want to give you guys, you know, the understanding of what, how, and why we're doing these things. So realistically speaking, if I've got a private line and I want to, you know, send a message to Chris on the other end of the line, it's just the end of the wire. But right on the internet, it could be 20 routers. I have no concept of what it's going to take. So kind of keep that in mind. Latency, bandwidth. Packet delivery, all of that is best effort on the, on the internet. So you can create an a, VPN with a, AWS. So you got your data center, you got your AWS, you create that encrypted tunnel. It's called the site to site VPN. Now you could create that to multi sites called the multi site VPN, but you just connect it to one site. It's a site to site VPN. Both sides need to be configured. So what happens is, you know, you configure the AWS side on the, the management console, CLI or API. And you know, if you don't know what to do, they'll give you a configuration that you can cut and paste in your router. If you do know what to do, you can just cut and paste. You can type in the configuration in your router on both sides and you can really tune it and make it what it needs to be. So basically setting up a tunnel between the two things. Now, when the tunnel gets set up, they do an instant key exchange, which establishes the attributes of this tunnel, the algorithm, the encryption type, and you can set up BGP for routing. Now, we'll talk more about BGP and guess what? If you guys are struggling with BGP, when we talk about direct connections, and you want, and you want me to do a BGP for cloud architects thing, heck, we could do a breakout session and cover BGP for cloud architects. I want to make sure you guys have a great, great, great cloud architect experience and a great solution architect boot camp. I want you all getting cloud hired, so we'll do what we need to to get you guys help. Now, this is something that I need you to keep in mind. When you deal with AWS, they say our VPNs are highly available. And what they mean by that is when you create a VPN tunnel to AWS, and I'll show you, it creates two tunnels. One is a tunnel to one AZ, 
and then another is another tunnel for another availability zone. Now, you would think that's higher availability, but it is not, and I'll show you why. But on the AWS side, that router that you connect to is a high availability router. What do you mean by high availability router? It means logical. It means if it, it won't go down, theoretically speaking. So you can connect to only one on their side, but your router on your end is not highly available. And I'll show you what a highly available router is if you want, but realize this, if you've got a router on your end and your router is not avail highly available and the AWS is, if your router fails, you don't connect to AWS anymore. You're done. There's no more cloud computing, it's all over. So we can't count on the AWS VPNs being highly available. So what do they, what does it mean? So the way this normally works is you've got your one router here. This is the AWS recommendation. By the way, we network architects would never do this. The recommendation is you take your router and you just create your thing and it creates two tunnels. But the problem with that approach is if this router dies and it goes away, you have no connections to AWS. So realistically speaking, just because the AWS endpoint is good doesn't mean yours is. If you're gonna use one VPN, you should use another VPN with another router on your end. To kind of keep that in your mind, you definitely, definitely, definitely should do this. Look at it this way. I'm sorry I wasn't sharing my screen. Here's the way AWS is describing it. This is your router in your data center. This is theirs. Now, when you create this tunnel, it creates two tunnels, which is great. But here's the single point of failure. The AWS architects a lot of single points of failure in there, so we've got to remove them. Here's a single point of failure. What happens if this router goes away? There is no cloud. It doesn't matter if this is high available or not. We must have high availability everywhere. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. We're going to get gotten. Oops. We're going to get um, we're going to get crushed by these single points of failure if we're not careful. So, you know, that's where the things where in certification we're saying, hey, just do a VPN and it's magic. Reality is the cloud architect is if you do that your replacement will fit, will basically uh, be there within a week when that tunnel goes down and that router goes down. So two routers connecting to the high availability devices at AWS. So kind of keep them keep that in mind. One is never enough. So multiple things. Now, how do you set up to, so remember that it's reliable on their end, but not yours. So let's go back to that military outage. One is none. Two is one and three is greater than two because on our end, our routers are physical devices. Now, even high availability routers, we can make them two. What's a high availability router? It's got two router control modules or brains, like two CPUs, where it can fail over to one. It's got connections on multiple cards, so a card can fail or a port can fail. It's got multiple power supplies that are plugged into multiple outlets or on different circuit breakers that have different UPSs to different gener backup generators to different main generators to different power sources coming in. So that's what we're doing in high availability systems. There is no concept of a power failure in a real high availability system or a data center. Why? Because you've got power coming in from two sources. You've got generators, you've got backup generators, and you've got backup batteries. So don't really, so don't think we're getting a lot of power failures in data centers in, in real world time. So one is none, two is one, three is greater than two. Now, how do you set these VPNs up? It's pretty simple. First thing you do is you determine which AWS virtual gateway you're gonna to connect to because theirs is high availability. Then you pick a routing method. Do you put a static route or a dynamic route? For those of you that are not used to routing, here's what a static route is. I wanna to go to Chris's house. I know to go on I-95, make a left at this road, make a right at this road, make a left at this road. I know how to get to Chris's house. No, I'm a static route. Now one of those roads roadblocked by a car accident, a traffic jam, or police officer directing traffic, or a detour. I can no longer get to Chris's house because I know to go here, here, and here, but that's it. BGP or dynamic routing dynamically builds the map. It's like the GPS in your car. So now I want to get to Chris's house. I'm in my car, I'm you know, driving my car, Hong Kong to the guy in front of me, recalculating, recalculating. I make a left, I make a right, I go around. I'm at Chris's house. I bring my cat, Cindy, to Chris's house, Sunny, and the two of them are having a cat party time. I cook them up some shrimp and some scallops and some fresh tuna like I do for my cat every day. Poof, everybody's happy. So that's kind of how that works. So dynamic routing reroutes you automatically. Static routing is a manual route. Well, you know, I don't use a lot of static routes. The only time I use static routers is if I only have one egress point. And again, I'm a routing and switcher guy and have been for decades. So kind of keep that in your mind. So when you set up the VPN, you determine which gateway, you pick your routing method, 
you configure your tunnels, either the default one from AWS, which is going to work for most people. So if you're a cloud architect and you don't have a lot of networking background, you know, or the cloud engineers that are going to build this, I should say, we cloud architects need to have the network because we're designing it. For those cloud engineers that are going to build it, they can literally speaking get a default tunnel configuration. But, you know, if you're really good and you're really new networking, guess what? You can make it and you can tune it and you can really, really tune it. And that's what I would do. I would be designing my own router configurations. I don't believe in automagic anything. Whenever you use automagic stuff, just breaks and fails. So I try to use things manually. I don't use auto anything. And I've yet to see auto anything really work very well. Although auto VPN from Cisco, which is adding BGP subnets into your VPC, is pretty good. But that's not exactly auto. Now, you, the AWS will work with most routers, but they will give you, you know, a configuration for a Cisco router, a Juniper router, a Palo Alto Networks router, and a Fortinet router, which is pretty much all you're ever going to be using. And then uh, you can monitor your status because what? CloudWatch monitors pretty much everything. So you can use CloudWatch, but if you really need good information, you're probably going to get it from your router or your router's management software. Far more information than you're ever going to get from CloudWatch. So kind of keep that in mind. Now, we talked about the VPN. Now, the direct connection is pretty important. So, Chris, how long did we spend talking about VPNs? I was not monitoring that. Okay. So, if it's been more than a few minutes, if it's been less than more than 20 minutes, I'll take questions. If it's oh, been less yeah. Than so, you started talking about the cloud environments. That's where you started. And it's been you went to VPNs, so it's been twenty. Okay, minutes. so it's been twenty minutes. Okay, so let's do this before we get into direct connections. Let's take some questions. I don't want anybody losing. I I want to make sure we take as many as we possibly can. Yeah, and apparently something is wrong with my mic. Are you hearing that, mic? Yeah, a little staticky. Interesting. I was thinking it was my actual voice because I'm worse. Yeah, it is my voice. My voice is worse. I'm okay. Um, questions. Uh, what do we s okay, pop this one up. Here we go. Mad over cloud. Would we save if we use direct connection for essential data and VPN for non-essential? Matt over cloud, I wouldn't recommend doing any of that. In reality, in most cases, you're going to be using a direct connection for everything, and a VPN is exclusively for your back office in most cases. Because if you try to use your direct connection for some things and your VPN, Matt over cloud, if you've got a $300,000 CCIE that's actually going to be setting up the networking and constantly tuning your tunnel parameters, it could be done. But unless you're a CCIA, and I don't mean just any CCIA, I mean like a CCIA with 20 years of network architect experience, and you're a $300,000 network resource that that company is hired, the sophistication to try and send your things over direct connections and then using some other traffic on another network will cause so many problems in out of order packets that will cause most, it will cause 98% of the people that would try and do this to basically crash their cloud environment. So I wouldn't recommend it. But if you want to do this, it can be done, but make sure you get someone a CC. You got a CCIE that's got a number of less than ten thousand because you're looking for people with twenty to twenty-five years network experience in order to do that. So um, I can't cover this one in depth because in order to cover this one in depth, the answer to this, I would probably need about six months of eight hours a day to really go through it. It was seventy-five thousand pages of reading for the CCIE then; it still is right now compared to 500 pages for the certified solution architect professional from start to finish. So that's way beyond the scope of that. But I will do a, a BGP for Cloud Architects Day and we can talk about that or at least at a high level if you want. What is the relation between VPC and VPN, Naga? Absolutely nothing. The virtual private cloud is basically your virtual private data center that you have on the cloud. And a VPN is, is quite frankly a tunnel or a connection to the VPC. So there really is no relationship between them at all. If we had a direct connection, we wouldn't even have a VPN. We could have a direct connection in the backup, so there'd be no relationship. But the VPC is your virtual private data center, your virtual private cloud, but it's really a data center. And your VPN is a connection to the data center. It's a great question. Fison, 
What's between what's the difference between site, site and client? Um, well, they're both sites. So if you connect two locations, it's called the site to site VPN. If I connect one location to three locations, it's called the <coughs> a multi-site VPN. Um, that's just it. John Clark, how do you solve the high availability problem with VPNs? You don't. So I would never, ever, ever recommend a high availability VPN solution. So John Clark, if you did, here's what I would do. I would basically get six to 10 internet service provider connections all across different internet service providers. One being say AT&T, one being Verizon, one being AT NTT, one being Centrelink. <clears throat> and then I'd find three or four other big service providers. Then what I would do, as I would do EBTP peering to all six, eight or 10 of these internet service providers. And that would give me really good routing. And the reason that would give me really good routing is I'd be connected to say 80% of the internet with a single hop away. And then what I would do is I would create my IPsec tunnel over those eight load sharing internet connections. And that's how I would make it high availability. But again, to do this, you're dealing with a $300,000 network architect that even knows how to do this. So I wouldn't. John, I would use a I would use a direct connection, which is a private line, and a backup direct connection. And in most cases, the architectures I work for, John, have three or four direct connections as primary, three or four direct connections as backup, and basically a 10 gig internet or or, a, or multiple 10 gig internet connections just for backup. So you know you don't have high availability with VPNs. You can use a bunch of them, but they'd have to be off so many different internet service providers to actually make it work because there's no guarantee to performance on the internet. Chris, if you want to bring in the next one? <clears throat> it's a great question though. How can you plan against internet failure? That's the key. You have to connect to about 10 internet service providers. So when I started my career, we were always taught, don't get two connections to Verizon. Now, initially, why would people get two connections or two wires? If wire one fails, wire two is good. But when you're connecting to the same internet service provider or WAN provider, if the WAN count fails, you're good. But if the service provider fails, you got nothing. So it's kind of like AWS when they, have when they have a control plane failure or a network failure, where basically they've got multiple regions and availability zones all damaged because of something going on in Ohio. The point is you plan around it. You plan against internet failure by using multiple, multiple connections. And that way you don't have to worry about it. But if you're using a private line, guess what? There is no internet failure because you're not using the internet anyway, which is why you always use a private line for anything that matters. And I'll be talking about private lines next because Jamie, that's an exceptionally good question for that reason. Meyer, does Direct Connect provide high availability? Not by default. We can create high availability, but nothing is high availability unless we make it high availability. But you can do it with Direct Connections and I can show you how to do it. In fact, Maybe we'll do a little breakout session today and I'll show you how to create true high availability connections between environments. If you guys like that, let me know and I'll do it. It's architecture and I love architecture. Chris, we could probably do one, maybe two more questions and then we should get back to the content. Okay, give me a second to find the, sure. the ones today. And again, some of these we may not have gotten to yet. So this one probably get to later. What do you think? Can you publish an internet gateway between uh, the public and private subnet? When we talk about internet applications in that section of the course, we'll talk about where to put them. But it has to be in a public section. And then we already addressed the question that Direct Connect does not naturally provide high availability, but we can make it provide high availability. IPsec can be used through any kind of AT&T Verizon connection as long as you have uh, an internet con as long as you have internet connectivity. How do these work from home concept work? We are connecting organizations using a VPN. Okay, so um, Santosh, what we're really talking about those questions you're asking about, you're actually asking about VPN concentrators and VPN architectures. Um, we may have the time to put that into here, but VPN architectures and VPN concentrators are again going to that CCNP world 
um, in between the CCNP and the CCIA and are way, 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 way above this. And truth be told, they're far beyond the AWS advanced networking either. That doesn't get anything close to that depth either. So um, I don't know how we can address that here, um, but what we can probably do, Santosh, is uh, I will uh, basically, uh, I'll, well, at some point during this architecture, we're going to design a high availability system. I'll make, I'll make a commitment that we'll just do a whiteboard session and design some high availability, and uh, we'll show you how to do this, because it's a good question. Um, but no, it's, it's you're, you're always going to get more speed out of a, well, you'll usually get more speed out, out of a private line, but you never know. See, the internet could be perfect one day. The internet could be great, or the internet could be slow. There's no guarantee of anything on the internet. So when, or, when you need to work from home, it depends on what your use case is. Could your use case work with a VPN? Most cases it can for a single user, and here's the reason why. If you're in your house and your internet goes down and you don't work for two minutes, who cares? Now, let's say you're a neurologist and you're dealing with stroke patients. And if you can evaluate the stroke patient within four hours, you can give a drug called TPA or streptokinase and you can dissolve the clot in somebody's brain and the person will have the stroke and go back to be normal and live a happy everyday life. This is good, right? Now. What if the, the, the neurologist can't see that people for over four hours, the person's permanently disabled. So, you know, that neurologist needs a direct connection because he can't afford packet loss. That or she can't. That neurologist, if she's evaluating a patient and they're looking for a facial group that looks like that, and they can't see it because the data is not getting through, there's a problem. Or if the neurologist is asking the patient a question and they're looking for a large speech and they can't hear it, then we've got a problem. So keep that in your mind. So um, direct connections are used when it's critical. VPNs are used when it doesn't matter that much. I think we can do one more question. Yeah, so this will be the last one before we move on to the next uh, content. What are the use cases for VPNs? Use cases for VPNs are connecting remote sites, connecting sites to the cloud, and anytime you're looking for cost-effective, cheap, and access to, the, to anything. Now, it's just... If it, if it matters, you have to understand that there's no guarantees over the internet. So you have no guaranteed performance over the VPN. So if you're connecting to a banking application, you don't use a VPN. But if you're connecting to an application to see photos of my cat Cindy, it's great. Or if you're just connecting to it to be able to SSH into your boxes and management, it's fine. So VPNs are great when you're not using a ton of traffic. And guess what? If you use too much traffic in the VPN, AWS will charge you more than the direct connection anyway. Because when we're talking about connections to the AWS, or any of the cloud providers, they do some funny billing. Here's what I mean by funny billing. Here's normal building, billing. I buy a house, a connection, private line from my house to Chris's house, from Palm Beach to Tampa, Port St. Lucie to Tampa. We own that connection. It's a 10 gig connection. I pay 10,000 bucks a month for that connection between Chris's house and mine. We've got 10 gigs with one millisecond latency at all times. It's great. Now, guess what? Um, and it's perfect because it's over the private line. Now I decide that I'm gonna use a VPN because it's cheaper. Now I'm sending data to Chris, but along the way, the, there's a big news story and it fills up the internet. Uh, apparently there's a picture of somebody that's not wearing the right clothes and it went viral. The whole internet's full and now my traffic's not getting through. So you use the internet when it doesn't, not, when you need connections, you need private secure connections, but they're not critical. If it's critical, you can't use it. So. Before we get right. back to the content, three so, things. Real yes, quick, Mike. There's a really important question that's come in from a few different people at the end. Okay. And we can do a simple answer, kind sure. of. I mean, as simple as difficult. <laughs> what is the difference between VPN and Direct Connect? That's a well, very I think important one. Much more clear. So here's here's a Direct Connection. You buy a wire. It looks like this. Effectively, it's a wire, and it's just between you two. Here's what the internet, a, direct, a VPN is. You connect to the internet and somehow on the internet you encrypt your stuff in between you two. So which do you think is gonna be better? A wire that you guaranteed to have that same wire performance or just an amorphous anything? You send it there and you don't know what the heck happens to it. That's what happens to your internet. So that's the main difference. The direct connection is a wire. The internet is a secure encrypted tunnel through the internet and the internet has no guarantees in speed performance or bandwidth. We always call direct connections private lines because it's a wire, effectively. And I'll show you the way they do the wire at AWS 
because it's slightly different than others, but it's just a wire. So let's get into the direct connection concepts. And then after direct connection concepts, if any of you guys have any questions about it, I think it'll be a lot easier to go over it afterwards. So let's talk about a direct connection before we talk about, because I think it'll make it easier if people are asking the difference between a direct connection and a VPN, if we talk about the direct connection first, just a thought. So a direct connection is the equivalent of a wire between you. So why would you use direct connection? If you need guaranteed bandwidth, use a direct guaranteed connection. If you need guaranteed reliability, use a direct connection. If you need consistent latency, use a direct connection. So what does that tell you? If you're designing a high performance, high availability network, what are you using? Everybody, type it, direct connection. Now, if it doesn't matter, what are you using? A VPN. If you're sending a lot of data, use a direct connection. So you're using a direct connection. Now, when you get the direct connection, you can get them in one gig, 10 gigs, and 100 gigs. So one gig, 10 gigs, 100 gigs. Now we know. Now you know what a direct connection is. It's a wire. Now, I'll show you the way that AWS does their wires because it's a little different than the whole rest of the world, but it's just a wire. So now you know when to use direct connection. If it matters, use a, v a direct connection. If you're looking for cheap and it doesn't matter so much, use a VPN. So we can get our speed in one gig, 10 gigs, and uh, we can also get them in 100 gigs. But you can do something called a link aggregation group. So here's what a link aggregation group is. One gig plus one gig link plus one gig plus one gig plus one. One plus one. If we have four one gig links. We can bundle them together into four one gig links, add them together. That's four gigs. Or we could take four 10 gig connections, bundle them together. Now we've got the equivalent of a 40 gig line and it only looks like one wire. So we can use more than one link and we're gonna use more than one link a lot of the time. What do you think happens if we use four direct connections and they're building, building a link aggregation group and one of the links fails? Ding, we got three more that are good. Another one goes, ding, we've got two more that are good. So we can really create some high performance bandwidth and redundancy by using direct connections and link aggregation group. If it matters, you know what you're going to use? Link aggregation group. And if it's truly critical, you might have a link aggregation group on a high availability, high performance router with four routers. And you might have another link aggregation group on another one. And heck, you might even have a 100 gig internet connection that you might use as a VPN backup or four 10 gig internet connections that you're using that you're load sharing for your VPN. That's how you do high availability, real high availability. So. And Chris, actually, you know what? For people that are curious tonight, we did a multi-cloud high availability session on our YouTube channel. And if you want to pop that in the chat box and inside this, um, and inside this, you know, kind of keep that intention. So that's what we're talking about. In reality, it's basically a wire. So what, is it, what does it look like logically? And then I'm going to show you the technologies non-logically. Logically, it looks like this. Logically, we've got the organization. The organization um, connects to the direct connection facility, which is a building. We're going to talk about that. And that facility is going to connect you to your VPC. So it's a wire. But what makes this wire work, everybody? That's what I want to talk about next. So what makes this wire work? Well, we're getting a long distance Ethernet connection. When we're dealing with Cat5 cable, our traditional copper cable, it's good for 100 meters. Now, we got to connect something far away. So that means fiber optics. Now, when you're dealing with fiber optics, what you're going to deal with, huh, wait, I have one over here. So I happen to have a router sitting behind my desk. These are traditional Ethernet ports. Now, over here, these are fiber optic ports. And what happens is you put an optic in here, which is basically a laser, and you connect a fiber optic connection to it. So... What are we dealing with? We're dealing with fiber optic connections. Now, when we deal with fiber optic connections, we have two kinds. We have single mode fiber and multi mode fiber. Multi mode fiber is good in the data center or short. Single mode fiber is used for long distances. So, if you see a test question that says the specs of the fiber optic connection, what will they be? Well, if you're dealing with one gig, it's going to be 1000 base dash LX. And if you're dealing with the 10 gigabit, it's going to be 10 G based dash LR. And that refers to the lasers and the signals that are being used for that fiber optic connection. Now, if you're like me 
and you've worked on a lot of fiber optic connections, you know that there's a send laser and a receive laser. And all this stuff goes talk, talk, receive, talk, receive, talk, receive. How exciting. Talk, receive, talk, receive. All's good, right? This laser goes down. Now we're just talking, but we're not receiving anything. Now, here's the problem. The routers may not, may not actually detect that the link's down because half of it's up. So AWS is good in this case that they support something called bilateral forwarding detection. And what does this mean? It means if this link goes down, it'll remove the whole thing. And that way you don't have a situation where you're sending and not receiving because effectively it's not working and you need to know about it. Why? We're using dynamic routing. That thing goes down, that link, we just switch to another link and that's how we promote high availability. So kind of keep that in mind. Now, when we are connecting to AWS, and I'm gonna show you more about it in a minute, we're gonna be sending them a VLAN. And why are we gonna be sending a VLAN? Because they're gonna use a layer two backhaul into their network. So, you know, kind of keep that in mind. Now, the last thing to remember is we have to set up our switch to tag that port with the appropriate VLAN that we're sending them. So keep that in the back of your mind. So we're gonna show you in a minute what this looks like, but what really is it? What really is this the connection environment look like? I told you it's a wire. In fact, I told you it's like this wire over here. And normally it is, but AWS does their stuff differently. So let's say we're gonna provide a really high availability environment. On the right over here, we've got our data center, a, bit, a nice data center, it's working good. Now we have two routers here. We've got a router over here and a router over here, but for argument's sake, we just drew one router. What we're doing is we're gonna buy a connection to the direct connection location. So we're gonna reach out to our WAN provider and we're gonna buy a direct connection to their direct connection location. So what is, okay, so that's them here. I'm in Palm Beach, Florida. There's a direct connection location. Let's say it's in Miami. I connect to the Miami facility. Now the Miami facility needs to go back to AWS. So here's what it works, how it works. I order my direct connection and I connect to my router in this specialty building called the direct connection location. For those of you guys that have some internet capabilities or internet routing, maybe you've heard of a point of presence where your service providers are. So what are we doing? We're connecting to our internet point of presence. We connect from here to the, to the uh, direct connection location. At the direct connection location, we connect it to our router. So look, we've connected to us. That's great, but we're not connected to AWS at all. We bought a connection from us. Now, in order to go from our routers, which are here and here to the AWS network, we need to run, we need to put a cable between us and them. See that little pink thing that we drew over here? That pink thing is a cable. And what is it? It's a wire that's gonna plug from your router to the AWS router. That little pink strip over here is called, this thing over here is called a cross connect. A cross connect is a wire from one switch to the next switch. That's all it is, it's a cross connect. So now you know. So, Keep that in the back of your mind. So we buy a connection. We have to request what's called a letter of authorization from AWS. That letter of authorization enables the service provider at the direct connection location to run the cable between your device and their device. And then your device is, is backhauled via layer two to the AWS backbone. So that's how it works. You buy a wire to the location. The location, then you, you co contact AWS for a direct connect which basically buys another wire from your switch in their data center to their switch in their data center, and then it goes back to the AWS network. So keep that in the back of your mind. You know, I know we're covering a lot of the networking in the first day, and I know we're covering a little more than just the Certified Solution Architect Associate, but I'm doing this because if you get this part wrong, nothing will ever work. And that's where the certification falls short, so I want you to know. So that's where we're spending so much time here. So to use, to get this direct letter of authorization, again, you buy a connection to the data center and then you need that wire to connect your device to the AWS device. So what you do, to get this direct connection locator, location letter, to get the, the letter of authorization to connect, to get your direct connection cross-connected, you have to get the letter of authentication. So you request one via the management console, the API or the CLI. And as soon as you do that, when your application is complete, AWS is gonna configure their switch on their end. Then you download your location. 
you hand it to your service provider, that letter of authentication, and they just run that little cross connect, that little wire between your switches. And then poof, you're done. Now, when we're talking about connections and direct connections, we're really talking about two kinds of connections, public interfaces and private interfaces. So what do you think they would be? A public interface is going to connect you to public stuff, public endpoints, things like DynamoDB, SQS, et cetera. That's what we're going to connect with with public internet. And the way this is going to work and the way you're going to find your routing information is we're going to use BGP. And again, BGP is a routing protocol that's used for interdomain routing. So that's what we're using. Now, I could talk a lot more about this, but we get into some pretty heavy BGP things. It could be pretty complicated. Now, when you get a direct connection, you can get a private virtual connection, which goes to your things, and a public virtual connection, which goes to their things. These are logical connections. A private connection goes to your stuff, your VPCs. Now, you got to remember, when you're using BGP to connect to AWS, it's a very minimal BGP implementation. You can send them up to 100 routes. So what does this mean? Good IP addressing. If your IP addressing is bad, you've got no cloud because you've only got 100 routes. So you need to be able to do route summarization. So unless you guys are CCIEs out there and used to route summarization, get yourself some help from somebody that knows. So before we get into storage, which we're going to do in a minute, let's just talk about the link aggregation group one more time. Here's what a link aggregation group is. We buy get multiple direct connections, and we bundle them to make them look like a single direct connection. And then we've got multiple direct connections, and, a, and we bundle them somewhere else. So we've got multiple links in a single link. And now, if this router were to fail, or one of these links were to fail, we've got multiple things. So here we've got a link aggregation group as a primary, and a link aggregation group across different internet service providers, or different service providers and different routers on another one. So I very, 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 very briefly went through direct connections because there's not much direct connections on the Certified Solution Architect Associate exam. And I kind of gave you the Certified Solution Architect professional level depth on this. So before we go, the next thing we're going to get into is storage. Before we get into any storage, I think we can potentially do one or two questions in direct connection, and that's it. And then we got to go back to storage. So getting back to that last question, that's the difference between the direct connection and the VPN. The direct connection was that wire that went through the direct connection location with its guaranteed performance. And uh, realistically speaking, you know, that's what we're really talking about. So go out there, build your things, go big, really go out there and build yourself all the redundancy, all the availability and all the performance that you need. So let's talk about AWS storage. Now, when we go on AWS storage and we start having fun with talking about storage, because I love storage, when we discuss storage, I want you to do the following. We are going to teach you storage. And what I mean is first, we'll teach you what the storage were. And Chris, you know, I was waiting for questions to be brought on the screen. So um, if there was one or two well, questions. Uh, yeah, I was, I was trying to get you to, to go big screen so that I could bring them up. Yeah, I couldn't yeah. understand what you meant. That's why I said yeah. go big screen. How is bi-directional link different than the universal link down detection? Um, it's identical, but it's AWS. So of course, they have to use another name for it. Um, but that's identical in the way it works. Great question. Great question. Conrad, it is time consuming to install a direct connection. Is it expensive? That's all relative. Um, I don't know of any organizations that wouldn't be using a direct connection, except for maybe a Starbucks office. Um, if you use a VPN too much, it's expensive. Yes, there are more costs in installing a direct connection. But in general, I don't see you have a choice in those cases. So it's either use a direct connection or just assume that you're going to have pretty horrible performance. And uh, so is it more expensive? Yes. What's the best way to connect your on-premise to the cloud? I'm going to give you the engineering answer. It depends. If you're dealing with a coffee shop, the best way to connect them to the cloud is with a VPN because it doesn't matter. If you're dealing with a doctor that needs access to the cloud, it better be a direct connection. If you're dealing with a bank where seconds mean, mean millions, better be a direct connection. 
If you're home in a grocery store and the grocery store serves cats and coffee or serves coffee and it's like a cat place where there's a bunch of cats in there and they come up to you while you're drinking your coffee, chances are if your systems go down for 30 seconds, it doesn't matter. And if your systems go down for 30 seconds in this environment, it's probably far, far, far better to just use the cheaper cost of the VPN. So it's never a best way. All of architecture is about understanding the business requirements and coming up with the right solution based upon the business requirements. So that's the answer. Could be either based upon the use case. Does AWS provide direct connect route? You buy your own routers on your end, Valentin. You buy yours. On their end, they're logical devices. Now the routers they're using, some will be Cisco, some will be Juniper, some will be ones they've made themselves, which they've done as well. So there are going to be lots of different devices. Can we say direct connection with link aggregation provides high availability and with link? Um, no, we can't say that because if we provide four link aggregation things on a single router and that router fails, it's still not high availability. So it's higher availability. So one is none, two is one, and three is greater than two. You can never have high availability if you're only using a single router. So, you, uh, so it provides higher availability, but no, you need two routers if you want high availability, which means two sets of link aggregation groups. So somebody, I think, knows that we are cat people. If your link goes down in the cat cafe, it was probably cat chewing the cables. Absolutely. So I run an open stack cloud here. Are turning off the server themselves? <laughs> yeah, I have an open stack cloud here that's got 10 24 core servers, and it's beautiful. Until my cat Cindy unplugs my Ethernet cables, she unplugs my power cables, um, she unplugs my switches. And uh, she does some really cute things with her paws and the power buttons on my computers and servers constantly. <laughs> so, yep, yeah, that's uh, definitely there. Okay, right, should we get in? Is there, should, is there have, any more questions or should we get into storage? I have one more for you before you get back into storage. Let's talk about one more. Is your direct connection router, router your ISP? Um, it's your service provider. Now, you're not connecting to the internet through an internet service provider. Certain internet service providers also provide private lines, but some don't. So there's lots of internet service providers that only connect you to the internet. But there's other service providers like big ones, like Vodafone, Etitsalat in uh, UAE, NTT in Japan, um, BT, Verizon, companies like that, you can buy a private line from them or a direct connection and you can buy an internet connection. So you can buy both from them. Okay, before we begin, you know, please make sure to hit the like button, subscribe. Please tell others, you know, we're going to keep this content up. We want to help as many people as possible with this free cloud architect training and free solution architect training. So, you know, kind of keep that in your mind. Let's talk about storage. I love storage. You know, if we're going to put if we're going to put computers around and servers, we're going to have to store it somewhere. Otherwise, you know, what's the point? So what is storage? Storage is quite simply the environment where an organization keeps their data. Now, we've got two kinds of storage. We've got volatile storage and we've got non-volatile storage. What is volatile storage? DRAM. You got something in RAM, you shut off your computer, it's gone. Volatile storage. In the cloud, we have volatile storage too. It's called instant storage. It's the only storage in the cloud that actually performs well. But if you reboot the server, it's all lost. So, you know, instant storage is an option. Instant storage is ephemeral or volatile storage, where non-volatile storage survives after a reboot. So non-volatile storage would be things like block storage or local hard drives or network file storage. Keep that in your mind. But no, storage is one of the most critical elements of your environment, the most critical. Keep that in your mind. So while we're at it, let's talk about the kinds of storage. And we're gonna talk about block storage, object storage, and file storage. And first, I want you to know, we're gonna talk about the tech first. Why? We're gonna talk about the tech first for this reason. If you walk into a customer and say, I'm gonna set you up with some EBS volumes and S3 buckets, they're gonna laugh and say, please leave. Now, if you're talking to the customer and we're gonna talk about their object storage environment and what we're gonna do with that metadata, and what we're going to do with their network file system, they're going to love us. And as cloud architects that design multi-clouds, we need to know what the technology is. Because if it's, if it's, for example, object storage, which we'll talk about, 
Google calls it cloud storage. AWS calls it S3. And Microsoft calls it blob. Guess what? It's just object storage. It's the same thing. So as architects, we need to know what it's really, really called, the real storage, so we can speak to other architects and other customers. So we're going to talk about the three kinds of storage. First, we're going to begin with block storage. Block storage is a type of storage area network. What does this mean? It's network storage. It's not local storage. And what's cool about block storage and this type of storage area network is the data is broken down into little blocks. That's what's called block storage because it's broken down into blocks and each block has an identifier. Now, what makes block storage so popular in cloud computing it is really efficient. Really, really, really efficient. Efficient. So keep that in mind. Now, why is block storage so efficient? Why? Because it can place the blocks wherever it needs to be. So normally you got your server, ding, ding, ding. In your server, you got a hard drive. That's where it goes. That's typically file storage. But in block storage, you're plugged into the storage area network somehow. And that stuff can be anywhere. So the storage could be anywhere, anywhere. And that's why organizations use block storage in the cloud because it can feel like local storage. It feels like file storage, but it is not. But it decouples the storage from the servers. So in my personal cloud, I've got some block storage. The servers can access it anywhere they want, but they don't even know where it is. And that's what makes block storage so useful because block storage is really scalable and it decouples the servers from the storage. So the cloud providers have their storage anywhere they want and you'll never even know. That's why they're using block storage because it's good performance. Now, what's it look like? You know, you take your data over here and it breaks it down into little pieces of blocks. That's it. And they've got identifiers, simple block storage. Now, the next kind of storage we're going to talk about is object storage. Now, object storage is used everywhere. What is object storage? And object storage is really special storage. You've got data. It's a storage area network. Again, what's your limitation of performance? The network. It's a storage area network. So network. Now, you take this data stuff and you break it down into objects. Now, object storage is really unique. Because when the data is broken down into objects, each object has an object identifier. And that object identifier also has metadata. Now that metadata is data about the data. Ooh, this gives us some really cool stuff. So now when we take our data and we break it down into this object, we've got metadata. So think about this. Looking at part of an object instead of the whole thing, because we can query little bits of it with like a range get. Pretty nice. Now we can run an SQL query on our data to find it. Hmm. Now we've got metadata that we can run SQL carries on. Hmm. Big data environments such as data lakes, again, object storage. So object storage is really useful storage, really useful storage. But what do we have to remember? Object storage is not real storage. Object storage is good if you write once and read many times, but you can't use object storage by a computer. You're not going to mount the object storage as a local hard drive. You can't. So it's not really usable, really usable in many cases. It's good for software distribution, big data environments, backup, that kind of thing, archival purposes, but not regular storage. So hmm, it's not regular. So we got to keep that. The other thing that we need to know about object storage is it works very differently. If I've got a file, let's pretend it was a swap file on a computer that changes a thousand times a minute. We'd have a thousand versions in object storage because the second anything changes by 1%, it creates a new version. So think about that. If you had a server with four terabytes of DRAM and you had a swap file that was six terabytes and it created a six terabyte file or object every couple of seconds or 60 times a second, you'd fill up your RAID arrays. So object storage is only, only, only useful for things that you write once and read many times. So you're not going to store your databases on it. You're not going to store an operating system on it. It's just to distribute stuff into backup stuff. So block storage, feels like a local hard drive over the network. Object storage, big data environments, backup and archival purposes. And I hope that makes sense to you. Because you know, see here, you know, you've got your data and it's broken down a little, little object, but it's that metadata or the data about the data that helps us make this work. Now, the last kind of storage we'll talk about, and we will talk about the AWS storages next, but I need you to understand storage first. Now, file storage, guess what? Your local hard drive is file storage the one in your computer. 
If you have an NFS, NFS share in a Linux and Unix environment, that's file storage. If you've got a server message box share with a Windows file server, guess what? That's file storage. If you're running an NTFS partition, it's file storage. If you're running a Mac OS partition, it's a, a, a what do you, they call it, the Mac OS expanded journal, that's file storage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It can be mounted by devices on the network and that's file storage. So we've now talked about block storage, object storage, and file storage. Why? Because if you're on Azure, you now know what it is. If you're on Google, you now know what it is. If you're on the Palo Alto cloud, the Dell cloud, the Fortinet cloud, the Verizon cloud, the IBM cloud, you still know what it is because we talked about the three kinds of storage and they work on every cloud provider. So don't be a solution architect that only knows one. Be a cloud architect that can work on everyone. You'll have more job opportunities. Now that we talked about the storage environments, let's talk about, we're going to begin with object storage. Now, this is really important. If you're on Google, it'd be called cloud storage. If you're on Microsoft, it'd be called Bob. And on Amazon, it's called Amazon Simple Storage. But guess what? It's the same thing. So now you know if you're making a multi-cloud environment, if you're using it, AWS and Azure, you're going to use Blob and Simple Storage. If you're going to do AWS and Google, you're going to do cloud uh, storage, and you're going to do it with S3. It's going to be the same thing. So what is S3? It's object storage on AWS. And because it's AWS, they integrate it into so many of their things. Now, object storage is relative, their S3 is relatively high availability, meaning 99.99% available. I wouldn't consider that extreme availability because that still leaves you about five hours of downtime per year, but it's relatively good availability. Now, the durability of this data is exceptional. So availability means that the ability to access it when you need it, and 99.99% is not that great. It's not terrible, but it's not that great. But 11.9's durability, meaning 99.99999, all the way to nine decimal places, that basically means that your data, once it's stored in AWS, you may not be able to reach it for five hours a year, but you're going to get it afterwards, and it's there, and it's not going anywhere. That number of 11.9's is so good that it's some of the best backup in the world. The very few things get that good. That's a really good number. And uh, S3 can send you notifications via things like CloudWatch or EventBridge. Just can keep that in your mind. Now, realistically speaking, there's a lot of types of S3 that we're talking about. So again, let's just talk about the use cases. Backup and archival of an organization's data. Static website hosting, front-ended by CloudFront. Distribution of content, media, or software. Perfect. Disaster recovery planning and big data analytics because of the metadata. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So, you know, S3 typically you organize it into bucket. And realistically speaking, a bucket's going to be a container for files that you're storing. So one of the good things is the buckets work with like a DNS and they created top level domains. So you can give your bucket names up to 63 characters, letters, numbers, hyphens, periods, et cetera, um, but keep that in mind. Now you can create a path with delimiters like forward slashes and backlashes, and we'll probably show you what that looks like to make it feel like regular storage. But remember, this is not real storage. This is object storage. What's really going on, object storage is this big flat environment. And it's basically like it's big and it's flat. And there's a pointer that points to the data in a database. So S Object storage is much more like a database. So the things we want to talk about when we talk about this is we're going to talk about securing your data, and we'll talk about the storage tiers. So let's talk about securing your data. If you put your data in object storage, you don't want people to access it, right? So you've got two options. You can create a policy on the bucket, and this is what I recommend. You create a policy. It's real granular, and it's based on IAM. The policy basically says, you know, who can do what, what they have access to, et cetera, et cetera. We'll show you what one looks like. It's the right way to do it. The other way that you can secure your data is you can use the ACL policy of read, write, or full control, your typical Unix permissions or Windows permissions, but, you know, kind of keep that in your mind. It's not the best thing in the environment. It's nowhere near as granular as a bucket policy. Now, when we're talking about S3, we're dealing with an environment where we're going to have multiple storage classes. We're going to be able to talk, we're going to talk about AWS S3 standard. We'll talk about S3 standard and frequent access. We'll talk about S3 standard, S3 and frequent access one zone. We'll talk about S3 intelligent tiering. 
We're going to talk about Glacier Flexible and Glacier Instant Renewal. Um, about 70 of my students, we all got on a call. They went through as much of the content from the new AWS environment and helped us update it to bring you the best AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate course. Um, and so we've got all the new content, as much of the new content as we could possibly find in here for you. So let's talk about first normal S3, S3 standard. So this is what they consider high availability at 99.99%. I don't know if that's high availability or not, but that's relatively good availability. Extreme durability and uh, very, and they call it high performance. S3's performance is, is good enough. Um, there is no high performance storage on the cloud for the most part, except for FSX by Lustre, but generally speaking, the cloud storage is much slower. Now, S3 standard. So you're gonna use this for frequently accessed data. Now, and we'll talk about encryption of storage coming up soon. What's great about S3 is you get access to your data when you need it, but and you don't pay to retrieve it. But by doing it, they charge you more per megabyte stored. So now what you're trying to do is let's say, for example, you've got S3 and you want to use some lower cost storage, but you don't plan on using it that frequently. So you can put your data in something called S3 and frequent access. And it's still going to be the same high availability going to have the same durability. It's even going to give you the same performance, which is really good, but you're going to pay less for it because, you know, it's infrequent access. Now, when you need to access your data, guess what? You're going to pay for it. So you're going to pay less to have it there, but you're going to pay to every time you need it, but it'll be instantly available, but you pay to access your data. So S3 and frequent access. If I've got thousands of photos of my cat, Cindy, and I don't think I'm going to go back to them for, the, for two years or for six months. I'm going to put them in frequent access. And then I'll pay to see my little cat when I brought her home with the little thing around her neck when I first got her and where she's a little, little cotton ball. So, you know, they're photos that I don't go to. So I might put them on S3 and frequent access and I'll pay to retrieve them. So every time I'm going to see a photo of my kitten, maybe I pay a penny. But I save money each month on what I'm paying for the cat. So that's to store the cat photos. So that's what we're talking about. Now... The next thing that we're talking about, which I don't recommend, is something called S3 infrequent access one zone. So that's reduced availability storage. So I don't like 99.99% available anyway. And now we're going to use one zone and it's going to be less than that. I don't really think this is really something we're really trying to do. Um, so those kind of things. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So um, keep that in mind. So when we're dealing with S3 one zone, we're going to have reduced price and reduced pricing, which is okay. And we're going to be paying to retrieve our data, which is still okay because we're paying less to have it. It's still instantly available. But no, that it's not four nines available. Now, four nines availability is not great. That means five hours of downtime per year. And that's standard. Now we're going to reduce it to one availability zone. What is the performance of one availability zone in terms of availability? 99.9% .9 of the time, which is not that great. So just kind of keep that in your mind. So it's up there. It's cheap. It's good access and it's appropriate for certain use cases. All that's good. Just make sure you're using the right storage at the right time. Now, here's where it's getting pretty intelligent. Now, if you're not greatly in charge of your data, and generally I like to plan things other than use automagic things, but this case I'll use automagic. And this is S3 intelligent tiering. And what's going on is S AWS is monitoring your data. They're looking at your data, they're looking at access patterning, they're running some machine learning algorithms, and they just move your stuff automatically for you to the lowest cost storage. That's pretty great. It's kind of like an automated lifecycle policy, so we really like these kind of things, and we're really, really happy to see those. AWS does the cost management. So their version of cost management and your might not be the same. So that is the challenge that we're talking about here. Just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Now there's something new. I'm loving this. It's called S3 Glacier Instant Renewable. Re Instant Retrieval. So let's say you've got something you're really going to store. And you don't really need to use it very often. Photos of my cat Cindy that I'm going to store for the next six years. I'm going to stick it in S3 Glacier. Why? Instant Retrieval. Why? Because it's so cheap to put it there. But I have to pay every time I want to receive it. But that's okay. Because I'm going to store photos of my cat Cindy Lots of them for a long period of time. And guess what? It's cheap. And I'm only paying when I need it. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. 
So let's go to the storage tiers. Um, we've got Amazon S3 Glacier Flexible. That's your traditional glacier. Now with this, you've got the option to make it immutable, meaning no one can modify it. So what does that mean? You're a bank. You have to store your transactions for seven years. You stick it in an immutable vault. Glacier does that for you. You're a hospital. You have to store patient records for seven years. Guess what? You store them in a place where they can't be modified. Glacier immutable vault. That's what this is designed for. This is perfect. So a hospital has, has all their patients' medical records. They stick it in Glacier vault. All of a sudden, they find out they got sued and they've got to pull somebody's medical records. Or the person that had a heart attack comes in for the second time. You pull the records from Glacier. It's cheap. And then you have it. But the rest of the time, you're just storing all this archival stuff so cheap. So we kind of like that. And that's where we're kind of doing these things. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. When you're using this, we can get our data relatively quick, minutes to hours. And it's relatively low cost, even cheaper than Glacier Instant Retrieval. But, 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 we've got to pay for everything and it's going to take longer to get it. So keep that in your mind. These are the kind of storage tiers that you actually have. Now, the last kind of storage we're going to talk about is something called S3 Glacier Deep Archive. Now, this is going to be the cheapest storage we can deal with. And this is really optimized for data that you can get even when you need it within 12 to 48 hours. So this is not your average storage. You're using this if you can wait a day to get access to your data. So it's really, it's cheap, real cheap, but it's not designed for, for information that you're gonna access more than once a year. Now the good news, it's high availability. Your data is stored in at least three availability zones. So it's designed for really long-term storage, optimal for regulated industries, such as healthcare, banking, finance, that kind of thing. Now let's talk about life cycle management. So this is something that I want you to all understand. S3, and whether you're on Google storage platforms or Microsoft platforms or AWS, it all enables you to do this. A lot of organizations, say, let's say for example, they only access their, they access their data very frequently for the first month, occasionally for the second month, and then they don't access it ever. So here, you could set up a policy that says store your data in S3, after 30 days, it will automatically move, move the policy to the, uh, to the S3 and frequent access piece. And then 30 days later, it'll be moved to Glacier. So keep that in the back of your mind. Now, I hate when a company takes the normal feature of object storage and calls it a special feature. So with object storage, anytime a file gets modified, it creates a new version. So AWS has a feature, which basically is normal object storage, which means you can turn on versioning. What is versioning? It enables object storage to do what it's supposed to do, which means it creates a new version every single time. This is default behavior of object storage. Now with AWS, they may have a script or something that automatically deletes your data every time you save a new version without versioning, but versioning by default is part of object storage everywhere in the world. And all versioning is, is every time a file is modified. So let's say you made a document. Let's say we made a document called Certified Solution Architect Associate. We started out with one, I saved it, created a new version, saved it again, created a new version, you know, got 154 versions of the same thing. And that's what happens. So is object storage good for files that change a lot? No, we're gonna have 150 versions. Now let's say this is a critical document that we're all working on and it's stuck in object storage. And we've got 150 versions. And then I send it to one of my teammates and they do something goofy. I can go back to the old version. So that's kind of good with object storage. So, you know, kind of keep this in mind. What are we using? How are we using? Why do you? It's all engineering for us. It's all what are we using? So the last thing that I want to show you guys here is the multi-factor authentication delete. So how do we make our stuff more reliable? We make sure we don't get rid of it when we need it, right? I mean, you don't want to be getting rid of stuff that you need. I don't want to be. I want to keep the stuff that matters. So how am I going to do that? I'm going to go to delete something. So I'm going to set up multi-factor authentication. I go to delete something, ding, 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 my phone rings. And the phone rings, guess what? It says, it says, enter your challenge. Then I go to my Google authentication app, ding, 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 ding. I paste it in and poof, I'm out. It, it deletes my thing. So I go to delete something, sends me a multi-factor authentication challenge. I provide a one-time password, object is deleted. So gives you some safeguards. 
Now, what we're talking about here to kind of keep this in mind, and then we'll take some questions uh, is before we get into uh, what we'll do is, okay, well, we're, we're, we're actually getting, there's a lot of object storage that we're gonna talk about. So we'll spend about five more minutes in object storage. We'll take some object storage questions and then we'll spend another half an hour in object storage or an hour in object storage, take some more questions. So I wanna make sure we're good. Remember, 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 object storage is not traditional storage, which means it is not traditional storage. It is a database, effectively. It's organized like a database, it is flat storage. There's a pointer to the data. Now, if any of us wanted to make like a comma delimiter, we can make it look and feel like a Unix file share. For example, I'll, I'll paste this into the chat box. I honestly have no idea what messages are going on in the chat box because there's so many of them, um, but Chris is monitoring them. But if I pasted this thing right now in the chat box, I basically showed a path, Mike slash 2020 slash AWS slash video slash storage says S3.mpfr, something I made up. Guess what? I made up those delimiters to make it look and feel like Unix file storage, but it's not naturally that way. It's just flat. I did it to make it easy for me. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind and that's what we're doing and how we're doing and why we're doing it to make it easier for us. So I'm gonna talk about encryption and encrypted storage, but I have a feeling that uh, we hit storage pretty hard. I'm worried I overwhelmed people for a few minutes. So Chris, see if there's any um, S3 yeah. questions. Do I sound better now? A little bit. Okay, I'm on a different microphone, so I hope it's better. A lot better, actually. Okay, good. It's an old school stand-up mic. <laughs> so, all right. There's quite a lot of questions before we get okay, to so encryption. Let's adjust some, and then we'll take some more. I want to make sure yeah. we satisfy every question. And while we're at it, hit the like, subscribe if you're at it, please. All right, let's go through here. And some of them are probably just some general quick answers. So I'm going to pop them up for you and you decide how deep to go. Sounds All good. Right. Here we go. Object storage, is that S3? Object storage is S3 on AWS, cloud storage on Google, blah, blah, Microsoft, and everybody has their own name for it, but yes. Why are IOPS so important in storage systems? Okay, Tushar, it's an excellent question. IOPS or input and output operations per second increase to how many times you can write. So when you're dealing with disk performance, you're dealing with two things. One is what's called latency and the other is called throughput. IOPS or input and output measures per second are realistically speaking related to the latency. The higher the number, the lower latency. Throughput, so what, what is that latency like? Let's say we've got a car and a tractor trailer. Now, they both decide to accelerate as fast as possible. The Ferrari gets to 60 miles an hour in two seconds, and the tractor trailer gets there in six seconds. As we can see, the Ferrari has much less latency to 60 miles an hour than, uh, or 100 kilometers an hour than the tractor trailer. Now, the next part is throughput, which is the amount of stuff you can carry, which is measured in gigabits per second. So let's go back to that Ferrari and the tractor trailer. In that Ferrari, you got a little bit of a chunk or a boot or whatever you can put your stored stuff, right? And that tractor trailer, you got a container. That's the throughput. So throughput is how much data you can move, whereas latency is measured in input and output operations per second, how quickly you can write to the disk. So they're very different. And there'll be times when you need more throughput, and there'll be times when you need lower latency. It's going to be based upon your application, and that's what you have to size. Fantastic question, Tushar. Excellent. Not sure if it's a question or a statement. Uh, well, here's the thing. Everything in the cloud is logical storage and it all sits on physical storage devices somewhere. So it's always gonna ultimately be physical storage on object storage, but it's gonna, when you create it, it's gonna be logical storage for you, but all the cloud stuff is gonna literally be sitting. So actually while we're at it, Brad, you know, it's a good question. So here's, I want you to think of the cloud. So you have something called the control plane. And these are basically gonna be a bunch of servers that orchestrate, you know, the stuff. And what happens, you go to create a virtual machine and the control plane is gonna say, goes to that physical server. You create your next machine and it goes to this physical server because that's what's open. Now you need the storage environment and it gets placed on this storage area network, which is attached to the network. That's physical network. Now you don't know, you just see it as your EBS volume. So it's always gonna be, whatever you access is gonna be logical, but the logical really doesn't exist. It always goes back to the physical. So if you walk into any AWS data center, it's no different than any other data center. Well. It shouldn't be. 
Now, AWS apparently had a power failure, which took down an entire data center. And realistically speaking, I've never seen a well-designed data center that doesn't have two power supplies coming in, two power companies, two generators, two backup generators, two backup sets of UPSs. So I've never seen a real power failure in a real data center in 25 years before. So you know, maybe AWS doesn't do that, or they got hacked. Who knows? We're never going to know. But whatever the case is, you know, it's all physical. These data centers are all physical like any other data center in any other environment. It's just physical. But what you access is logical. Why does the cloud, Brad, perform less than the data center? Because in the data center, it's all physical. And when we add that abstraction layer, that virtualization layer, that control plane, we lose about 10% performance. And that's why the cloud can never equal the data center. Because it's all logical versus physical. And we'll talk throughout this program about maybe some high performance uh, networking and things like that where we actually stick physical cards and pass them into the virtual machines. We can talk about that. Great question there. Regarding performance, isn't BlockFS effectively a SAN with PCIe? Um, well, here's the problem. Even the fanciest IO2 block express volumes decline we can get on the cloud, the IOPS are really low. So you can go right now to Best Buy and you can get a Samsung 980 Pro with seven gigabits per second throughput and a million IOPS. But if you get an IO1 ABS volume, the maximum you can get is 64,000 IOPS. So it means not or close to the performance. Now, after we get past that, next thing we're talking about is these new IO2 devices, which AWS has, which can give you a quarter million IOPS, which means if you put four of them in RAID zero, you can equal the performance of a $100 drive at Best Buy. So low performance storage in the cloud, good enough for 99% of our needs, but I realize if you've got a storage performance, you're gonna to have to be doing a lot of stuff with RAID and other things, which are way beyond the scope of the certified solution architect to make the cloud storage work. Brad Armour, so would you use infrequent access storage? Brad, Arm, Brad, I would use infrequent access storage for information that I don't have to access infrequently, that I access infrequently, because I'm gonna to have to pay to retrieve them. If I was gonna retrieve it frequently, I wouldn't put in infrequent access because it would be too expensive. Choose the storage class based upon your needs. What are some good use cases for S3 storage? Great question, Alexa. Um, backups of your system, distribution of software, um, static website hosting, and archival purposes. Chris, you wanna bring in the next one? Okay, so Mayor, we can in a traditional environment, instant storage, which is the highest performance storage available in AWS. Why don't we use instant storage? It's ephemeral, meaning it goes away with a reboot. So instant storage is a local hard drive, but the problem is it's in a virtualized environment. So it's ne so so the answer is it's it would it's it is a local hard drive, but local hard drives don't get waste get uh, what do you call it? Don't get uh, raced every time you reboot them. So. It's very similar to that. And EBS is really like block storage that's uh, that's a network storage. So an external hard drive uses a SATA connection or it uses a USB connection. But here we're using actual storage connection. So it's a storage error network. So it's not going to be like an external hard drive was connected, not on a network, but via a USB port or an eSATA port. It's network storage, which means it's attached over a network. So Think of a storage area network that you might be using or a network or a NAS server or something like that. It's much more like that. Amit, what is the default storage attached to EC2? Instant storage. And how is it different than EBS? Well, Amit, instant storage, the second your system reboots, you lose it all. And EBS, which we haven't talked about, doesn't go away with reboot. So you can never really store anything on instant storage, even though it's the only high performance storage available on AWS. Chris, I think we can do one more. What are the use case differences for S3? Um, we're now on uh, Naga, we're in such different cases. S3 is where you store stuff. Content delivery networks are about improving the web server utilization, reducing your DDoS attacks. So. Totally not even related. I will be spending hours this week talking about CloudFront. Um, right now we're talking about storage and that's a content delivery network. So it's kind of like comparing my kitten 
to a shark. Um, they're both animals, which is good, but they're totally unrelated. Okay, so there's all of you. So let's have some fun. Let's get back to the content. But before we do, type hashtag cloud hired because the whole goal of doing any of this training is to get you guys all cloud hired. So everybody take a minute. Hashtag cloud hired. If you've got, if you've not downloaded our free book for the certified solution architect professional, go get it. That book was featured in 407 media outlets today. Um, so many people are excited about that book. So I want you all getting your copy. It's completely free. So hashtag how cloud hired. Let's have some fun. Fantastic. I want you all hired. That's the reason I do this stuff. Every last one of you, my students are not. I still want you to have the best possible cloud architect careers, solution architect careers. So let's build these cloud architect careers of dream. And it starts with a dream. So get yourselves cloud hired. Jeannie, it's good to see you. Marla, I'm always happy to see you. Oh, fresh ash, oh, Betty, this is wonderful. Richardson, and you know, one day before we end this today, I want to see where you're all at. Not right now. And I bet you we have people in every country around the world working to help each other better. You know, I know my team's all over the place trying to work with people. And I'm loving every last minute of it. So fantastic. All you guys are here. Let's get you guys cloud hired, everybody. Okay, while you guys are typing the hashtag cloud hired, hit the like button, subscribe, and hit the bell. We have so much free content coming for you guys coming soon. So let's get as many of you can to subscribe. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. Cloud hired Dubai. I haven't been there in a little while, Tushar. Spent lots of time there. I absolutely loved it. Okay, let's talk about encrypting your data and keeping it secure. So we want to keep your data secure. So if you've got your data on a hard drive <coughs> and somebody steals this hard drive and takes it out of the house, guess what? They stole your data. Now, if I've got my phone here, and it's, let's pretend it's a hard drive, and it's completely, completely encrypted, and you steal my phone, and you don't know the decryption key, guess what my phone's worth to you? Absolutely zero. So we're going to encrypt our data. So if you don't have the key, it's meaningless to you. So Chris, could you provide the link to the free book? Lots of people can't find it. Can you pop it in the chat window, even though it's in the description? Uh, so sure if you will. can provide everybody with a link for the free book, I don't want anybody to lose this book. It was picked up by 400 press on seven press outlets in the last day. 5,000 people downloaded it in the first two or three days. I want to make sure that everybody gets it. I want everyone cloud hired. So when we have our data, we're going to encrypt it. And by encrypting it, if somebody has access to it, they can't use anything with it. And I love that. So we're going to encrypt it. Now, <clears throat> When the encryption makes your data worthless or useless without the decryption key, which is really great. So how do we do this? We protect our sensitive data with encryption. Now we can encrypt it, encrypt it on the client side, or we can encrypt it on the server side. So we'll talk about different ways to do this. <clears throat> now, AWS has a key management system. So you can use one kind of encryption, and that's called SSE-KMS. And this is the customer managed keys with the AWS key management system. Now, this is a complete key management system where the user manages the master key. But a, the key management system will provide the data, data key. And the key management system will provide an audit trail of who and how and when your data was accessed. So you can use the SSE customer managed keys with the AWS key management system complete key management solution. You manage your master key. The key management solution from AWS manages the data key, and it provides an audit trail of how, who, and when your data was accessed. So that's option one. <clears throat> now, this is another one. This is AWS SSE-S3, AWS managed keys. Now, if you're using this, there was a massive security hole that was found recently with AWS. But doing this, AWS manages everything for you. They basically manage your keys. So realistically speaking, uh, um, Chris, if you can find if you can find that link for the ebook, lots of people look like they're trying to look for it. Hi, I'm taking care of it. Okay, great. Um, so AWS manages the key management system is going to manage all your keys. It's going to rotate your keys constantly, and it's going to ensure that every object is encrypted with a new encryption key. 
So as long as there's no problems with the AWS key management system, like the big security vulnerability that was identified last week, this is a really good solution because AWS manages your keys. You don't have to think about it. It's in the key management system. They rotate your keys and everything's encrypted with its own key. So this stuff is really, really exciting. I mean, it really is in terms of things. So, you know, you can manage it yourself or they can manage it. Now, the next way to do it is really if you want to manage your own keys. Now, here's the reality. If you're running a very high security environment, a government security, military grade security, banking security, you're going to be managing your own keys and you're not going to trust anybody else's key management system. And here that's called SSE-C, complete autonomy. You manage your keys, but you got a lot of overhead with it. So let's talk about them one more time. Our three options for encryptions are we use customer managed keys with the AWS key management system. What does that do? Basically, the key management system manages all our keys and it rotates our keys with SSE-S3, AWS managed keys. We can do customer managed keys with the key MS where it's a complete key management solution where we manage our master key and the key management system manages the data key. And you know, our last, our other option is to customer provided keys where we manage everything, but most secure, but it's the most maintenance. Why are people going to the cloud? Seriously, why are they going to the cloud? They're not going there for better performance. They're going there for agility and flexibility. The ability to scale up and down as needed, which is really amazing. The ability to build a server in seconds versus weeks in a data center. That's why we're here. We're here for a lower burden. So most people are going to use some kind of key management solution because they're going there to make it easier so they can reduce their staff. That's how they're saving on tech with the cloud. It's easy, real, real easy. <clears throat> so kind of keep that in your mind. So let's talk about tuning S3 because we want to make it work for us. In this section, we're going to talk about using pre-signed URLs. We're going to talk about the multi-part uploads. We're going to talk about the range gets, and we're going to talk about cross-region replication. So, and I don't care whether this is Google, Azure, or AWS, we're gonna use the same thing. We're gonna use anything that you put in, in object storage, if you set it up right, is gonna be private. Now, how 16% of all hacking events that occur with the cloud are by somebody making a, 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 a private objects in S3 buckets public. 16% of all cloud hack, how to hacks, and this happens every single day Somebody's systems are getting hacked because they don't actually secure their objects in S3 properly, which is pretty bad. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Everything in S3 theoretically should be private. And if it is private, you will need to enable access to them. So you can do things. You can create an IAM user and create an account, or quite simply, I could just create a URL that's pre-signed, sign it with my key and send it to you. That's pretty simple, right? I want to send you photos of my cat, Cindy. I set up my encryption key and I send it to Eva Doike out there. She downloads it. She's got the key. She gets clicks that thing. I pre sign it with mine and she sees pictures of my cat Cindy. And then she probably sends me pictures of the cat and tells me how nice my cat Cindy is, who was a very nice cat until she brought me home a little baby rabbit last night. And she's a little bit of a doghouse right now, but that's neither here nor there. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. A pre sign URL, you sign it, you just send somebody the URL and they can simply download it. So nice it is. So let's talk about pre-signed URLs. Um, you sign it with your key. So if you sign it with your IAM instance profile, it'll be good for up to six hours based upon the way you set it. If you sign it by using the AWS security token service, this is much more secure. And because this is a one-time thing, your URL is good for 36 hours if you want it to be. If you want to create an IAM user account, guess what? That's with an IAM user, you can give that for seven days and with a temporary token, it's when it expires. Keep that in the back of your mind. So the method you use, instant profile, instance profile, six hours, security token up to 36 hours, IEM profile up to seven days. When the token expires, temporary token. So we talked about pre-signed URLs. Now the next thing is let's talk about multi-part uploads. So S3, for example, enables you to store a file of up to five gigabytes. Now, you can store up to a five terabyte object there, but you can upload up to five gigabytes. So five terabytes might mean a database that's being backed up. Five gigabytes is something that we upload. So keep that in mind. Now, 
If you're gonna upload to S3 from the internet, what do we know about internet performance? It's best effort, there's no guarantees, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, you know, if you're sending a five gigabyte file to AWS and you lose some packets along the way, that's a problem, you might lose your whole five gigabyte file. So what can we do to improve it? We can do something called a multi-part upload. And AWS recommends that every time you go above 100 megabytes, you split it by using multi-part uploads. You enable multi-part upload. Here we've got this, uh, let's say 400 gigabyte file or 400 megabyte file. You take the file, the file gets split into little mini parts. Part one, part two, part three, part four. And then it comes to the file and it gets resent back to S3. Why? If file part one gets lost and file part two, three, and four get here, all we do is we retransmit file part one. So by taking one big thing into little small things and tracking the state of all those small things, we can make sure that we can get it there faster and more successfully. So that's what we're talking about um, when we see these sort of things. We're gonna be creating multi-part uploads. The reason we're creating these multi-part uploads is to take a file and shrink it to multiple smaller files. Keep that in the back of your mind. I wanted to talk about one more thing while we're here, which is cross-region replication. So let's say we've got a region in US and a region in Europe. I've got this great guy, Dean, that I know that's in the UK. It's not technically Europe, but we're gonna call it Europe for right now. Let's say he's launching a, a website over there, um, over here in Florida. If, you know, if he's gonna keep coming, if Dean has an office and that office for, or website or whatever we want, is gonna keep running from the UK to US East over here, I'm gonna be paying constant inter-regional departmental transfer charges. If he comes to my S3 bucket 100 times a day, I'm gonna be paying 100 inter-region inter charges. That might get expensive. So it might be easier for me to take a bucket that I have in one region and just have them synchronized to another region. And that way if Dean's in the UK and he wants to access my files all day, I only paid to send it once over there and then he can access it locally. So kind of keep that. It's called cross-region replication and that's why we do these things. So if we've got a document, it just miraculously gonna get, oops, I don't know what has happened there, but whatever's gonna happen, it's just gonna miraculously copy each other. So think about cross-region replication. Bucket in one region and another region. So if a region goes away, you got another. Disaster recovery, less inter-region departmental transfer charges, awesome. Right? So cross-region replication is some pretty, pretty exciting stuff. So that's going to, you know, end the section on the S3. Now I'm going to talk briefly about instant storage for about three seconds <laughs> um, because, you know, you're not going to be using it on the cloud. Instant storage is quite this. You got your server. It's, this, it's the RAID array that's sitting in these servers. So, you know, you've got these servers inside of it. That's what we're realistically talking about is instant storage. So the storage local, but the problem is, and this is really fast storage. And why is this storage fast? This is basically sitting on a RAID array that's gonna have basically eight NVMe drives in a RAID environment. So we're gonna get eight times the speed of an NVMe drive. So think about that. If we're dealing with a thousand, a million IOPS per drive, we could be getting 8 million IOPS and 30, 40,000 megabit per second of throughput on that server, which is amazing. But it goes away on reboot, so what, what good is it? So kind of keep that in your mind. Keep that in your mind. So now let's talk about block storage. And then after we talk about block storage, we'll take some more questions. So block storage, as we talked about, realistically speaking, is a type of storage area network. You take your data and break it down into blocks. Um, so block storage is high performance storage, according to the cloud providers. It's not like instant storage, but it's the fastest we're gonna get. It acts like a virtual hard drive. And this is what you're gonna use on your servers to feel like a hard drive. So block storage is really scalable, which is great. It's not deleted upon instant termination and it's got high availability. So remember when I told you that I didn't think S3 or 4.9's availability was high availability? I still don't. But elastic block storage or block storage in AWS is high availability, meaning it's 99.999% available. That means five minutes and 15 seconds of downtime per year. That's high availability. 
That means chances your servers will have access to it for up to five hour minutes per year, which is good enough. That's high availability. So EBS, they call it mission critical. I can I would consider this to be good good storage for use. Now the key with block storage is, you know, they'll tell you it's optimized for high throughput and high transaction workloads. It's nothing close to instant storage, but it's the best we get on the cloud. There are multiple performance options. None of them are great, but we'll talk about what they are. EBS volumes are associated with a single availability zone, but they are backed up to another availability zone. EBS volumes are elastic block storage and they have the AWS branded version of block storage. So here's the way this stuff gets backed up. To keep it in your mind, you got your server, your server is mounted to an EBS volume, and what happens is they make snapshots which are basically an exact copy of what's on your drive. So if any of you ever worked with um, imaging programs where basically you make an exact copy of everything on the server, and if anything ever happens, you just relaunch that image and you're good to go, that's what we're talking here. Basically, we're going to have our EBS volumes that are now going to be pushed to S3 when they're backed up. And if we want to store these volumes, guess what? It's pretty awesome. We can even push them to Glacier and we can have copies of every virtual machine we have. Pretty exciting stuff and we can store it very cheap. So block storage volumes are backed up onto object storage, meaning S3. So how do you determine which kind of storage you need? Well, how do you determine everything? What are the requirements? How do you know what the requirements are? You ask your customer, which is why communication skills are the absolute most critical skill for the cloud architect. If you can't ask your customer what they want, you're never gonna know. Your designs will always be wrong. So when you choose your, your EBS volumes, your block storage, I want you to think about the following. What performance do I need in terms of throughput and latency? Because they're different. Latency is measured in input and out, is, would be measured in how long it takes to access your data, but it's most notably affected by something called IOPS or input and output operations per second. Whereas throughput is how much data you can move per second. Here's an example. We'll show you a drive, um, an EBS volume that is magnetic that has more throughput than an EBS volume that is uh, SSD based. But the SSD one has lower latency. So choose your what you need based upon your application requirements. So let's talk about the best performance you can actually get right now. The highest performance that you can get on the cloud is something called the EBS provision IOPS IO2. This is now the fastest block express that you can possibly get on AWS and it is 25% as good as a $100 volume, a $100 drive that you can buy from Best Buy, like a Samsung 980 Pro or a Seagate Barracuda NVMe drive. This has very good throughput, 4,000 megabit per second, which is about half of that drive that you can get for hundred bucks at Best Buy. This has up to a quarter of a million IOPS, which is a which is very good, but it's still 25% of that $100 drive at Best Buy. So when people say that cloud is cheap or the cloud is performant, you need to really know because your customers are going to care. And if your customers are going to say, I can't tolerate that latency, you're going to need to know what to do about it. So keep that in your mind. So AWS would say these EBS provision IOPS IoT volumes are the lowest latency design for high workloads requiring high input output. They'll tell you it's perfect for large databases or applications requiring low latency, and I'd agree with it. But if you need real performance, you're gonna have to stripe these things together in a rate environment. Because remember, that's still not that good. I can do four times better at Best Buy for hundred bucks. Let's talk about the next one. So the EBS provision IOPS. It's the old version of their highest performance. And this is relatively low latency, at least according to cloud standards. And AWS would recommend this for applications that require low latency. Now, this is all SSD-based storage, and it gives you throughput of up to 1,000 megabits per second and up to 64,000 IOPS. This is your traditional EBS provision IOPS volume. Now, I want you to think about that. That $100 drive from Samsung at Best Buy gives you 7,500 megabit per second throughput. So seven and a half times. That same drive gives you a million IOPS, which is about 15 times greater than this provision IOPS volume. Learn the cloud, know what your customers want. That's why I never learn a vendor I really need to know. So when your customer needs 2 million IOPS, 
if you needed these things, you might need, literally speaking, 30 of them in a RAID 0 environment, which would be insane. Because with RAID 0, if any one of those 30 drives fail, you lose them all. So you might have to do 30 in RAID 0 and another 30 in a RAID 0 and then do RAID 10 striping them together. So, you know, kind of keep this in your environment. So, and the link was posted to that book. Uh, you can just click on the link that's there because I see lots of people bringing it up. So now let's talk about the next version. This is what's called EBS General Purpose SSD Drives, GP2. This is general purpose SSD storage, relatively decent latency. Um, it gives you a relatively good value of price and performance. So what would I use this for? Maybe a boot volume, where that's not where my transactions are going to be, just something to boot the system. It's got uh, decent IOPS, but less than the provision IOPS. It's got moderate throughput of 250 megabit a second. So I want you to think about that. What does that mean? A traditional hard drive magnetic drive gives you about 150 megabit per second. 200 or 250 if you're using a 1500 RPM magnetic drive. A traditional SSD drive gives you 560 megabit per second. More than double this. And a good Samsung 980 Pro for 100 bucks gets you to 7,000 megabit per second or 7,500. That's, how, that's a lot faster than this, like 20, 30 times faster. So keep that in the back of your mind. Where would I use these for boot? And I might use them in a dev environment or a test environment because it's going to be cheap enough and good enough and it'll feel like regular storage in a reduced capacity environment. So keep that in the back of your mind. Now, the next is something called EBS throughput optimized hard drive. Now, this is an interesting one. <coughs> This is low cost magnetic storage, which means magnetic storage, high latency, which means low IOPS. But something interesting about this magnetic storage is the throughput's quite good, 500 megabit per second, which is perfect for a video editor or people that are moving large files around. That's quite good. <clears throat> so this is really great for throughput intensive workloads where you're pushing large amounts of data, inexpensive and great. So think about this. If you need an environment that's got high throughput, this is double the throughput of the SSD general purpose SSD drives and double, and it's a lot cheaper. So large log files, if you've got lots of sequential reads to write, if you're storing movies somewhere, this is perfect. Big data, just kind of keep it up. Big data that doesn't require low latency. Now, the last thing we're gonna talk about is cold storage. Now, this is gonna be the lowest cost Really low IOPS, moderate throughput of about 250 megabits per second, but you pay to retrieve your information. So this EBS cold SC1, we don't recommend it unless, unless, unless what you're talking about is uh, you're using stuff that you're not going to access frequently and you're just looking for some cheap place to store your stuff. They can be used by your servers, unlike object storage. So while this is more of a, this is not really part of the certification exam, what I'm gonna talk about next. Um, but what I really wanna talk about is how do we fix the performance? So if you're a cloud architect and you're trying to get a cloud architect job or a solution architect job, or you wanna be cloud hired, you know, you actually have to know how to work around the performance of the cloud. It's not enough for the AWS to say, look at my high performance EBS volume. You can't just believe that and say, my customer's gonna be happy because your customers won't be. Your customers expect performance and they expect you as the cloud architect to know the thing. So we're gonna talk about RAID, which is actually covered in the Certified Solution Architect Professional, but not covered in the Certified Solution Architect Associate. But there's no way that any of you could ever be employed as cloud architects or solution architects without this knowledge. So we're just gonna talk about it anyway. So what is RAID? RAID is the ability to take multiple disks and combine them for speed, performance, capacity, fault tolerance, et cetera. And we're gonna talk about several flavors of RAID. Now, the most common used RAID form, which is RAID 5, we can't do in the AWS cloud, but we're gonna talk about it anyway, and here's why. Your customers are using it. And if you're gonna take something your customers are using and go to the cloud, you have to be able to speak their language. So we're gonna talk about all four. So we're gonna talk about RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5 and RAID 10, because this is really, really, really important. What is RAID 0? Let's say I've got three hard drives. All right, let's just, I'll show you two hard drives and I'll show you what it looks like visually. 
what I do with RAID 0, it's called striping. So I take my data, I store it on one hard drive, the next 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 drive. So let's take my two hard drives or each 10 terabytes. And I put two together. I get twice the speed, right drive one, right drive two. And I've got two 10 terabyte drives. So guess what? I've got 20 terabytes and guaranteed speed because I'm combining my two disks together. So it's kind of like you've got two people trying to push a car. They're stronger than one. That's what RAID 0 is. And this is the best performance in terms of latency, speed, throughput, everything. But there's a little problem here. If I write half of my data to disk one and half of my data to disk two, and disk two were to just die, okay, disk two just dies, guess what? I only have half of my data and there's nothing I can do with it, which means I am done, dead, kaput. So RAID zero is too risky for the enterprise environment. Now, it's performance oriented though. Now, RAID zero is the only thing we can do in the cloud to get acceptable performance, hmm. but it's too dangerous. So we'll talk a little bit more about what to do. So the next version of RAID is called RAID 1. And RAID 1 is basically mirroring. And what is RAID 1? Let me pull up this slide so you can see it, and I'll talk about it. RAID 1 is simply you take one drive and you make a mirror image to another one. So now we've got two terabyte drives, 10 terabytes and 10 terabytes active backup going on all at the same time. Right block 1 to hard drive 1, right block 1 to hard drive 2. Right block two to hard drive one, right block two to hard drive two. Does that improve my performance? No, not at all. It might even slow it down a little bit. Now, does it improve my availability? What happens if hard drive one dies, my primary drive? I've got a backup of identical things. All I do is break the mirror and poof, I'm up and running. So RAID zero gives you ultimate speed. RAID one gives you ultimate redundancy. Okay, we're gonna talk about these two later. But kind of keep this, you know, keep it in the back of your mind why we're doing this. Now, what organizations traditionally use is they use something called RAID 5. In my data center here, we're running my own cloud. We're running RAID 5 everywhere because it's really good in terms of speed and performance, but it's not acceptable on the cloud. And here's why. Let's say RAID 5. Let's say we've got four hard drives here, four 10 terabyte drives. So we're going to use three of the drives for writing at any one time and one drive for backup. And we're going to put something called parity data, which is backup data. So you can see what I did here. We've got four 10 gig drives. So we're going to only use the capacity of three of them, fourth drive. So four 10 gig things in RAID 0 means 30 terabytes of capacity because 10 terabytes is wasted. So look at the flow. I'm going to write to block hard drive one, hard drive two, hard drive three. I'm going to write backup data. Then I'm going to write to this drive, to this drive, to this drive with backup data, and then regular data. Then I'm going to write to this drive, and then this drive with backup data, this drive, and then this drive. So what you can see is we're always spreading the backup data across all the drives. Now, why is this good? Why it's really good is if each drive gives us 150 megabits a second, and we've got three out of the four that we're using, we're getting about 450 megabit a second throughput, which is lots of performance. This is why organizations everywhere use RAID 5. Every major data center you walk into, they're gonna use RAID 5 everywhere. But why don't we use RAID 5 on the cloud? Well, if you're dealing with an, an EBS volume that's got 64,000 IOPS, 64,000 IOPS, 64,000 IOPS, and then we've gotta write this backup data, what we're gonna find is the time that it, write, it takes to write the backup data is gonna already kill our already horrible disk performance because remember the cloud doesn't have good disk performance. So now we're gonna slow it down even more by writing backup data. So that's why AWS doesn't support RAID 5 even though RAID 5 is used everywhere. I've got RAID 5 RAID arrays everywhere in my house. So what's the solution? The solution becomes RAID 10. What's RAID 10? Quite frankly, this. We take two RAID 0 environments. Remember I said RAID 0 was the best speed, but it had, it had no redundancy? So if we create a RAID 0 environment, and then we create another RAID 0 environment, and, uh, and then we ultimately replicate. So let's say I have four drives in RAID 0. I have four drives in another RAID 0 backup, and I mirror them together. Now, if I lose my first RAID volume because one of the hard drives fails or one of the EBS volume fails, ding, 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 no worries. I've got a second one. So RAID 10 is high redundancy. It gives you the maximum speed 
and the maximum backup. But what's the problem? I need twice as many drives here. So with RAID 5, I'm, I can prepare one or two drives, for example, for parity data. If I've got 50 drives in a RAID 0 array with RAID 10, I need 50 drives in the backup. So this gets really, really, really expensive. But if you're on the cloud and you need good disk performance, you have no good disk performance in the cloud. So this may be your only option. So I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. That's why we're doing what we're doing, how we're doing, and why we're doing it. We're working around the limitations of the cloud. And that is so critical. That's why the cloud architect is different. They have to think about how do they solve their customers' problems. And when you go from the data center to the cloud, you have to accomplish things like you know, not being able to put certain things where you want to put it, for example. There's lots of things for you to do. So now let's talk about file storage. And we're going to first talk about Unix and Linux file storage. So when you're dealing with Unix and Linux, you're dealing with a network file system, which was invented by Sun Microsystems, I don't know, 30 years ago. And that's what they that's what's used to share files between Windows and Linux servers. I mean Linux servers and Unix servers. Now, as it turned out, AWS has their own version of a network file system, which of course AWS sticks the word elastic in front of everything. So take network file system that we've come, we've come to know and love for the last 30 years or so. And now it's AWS, they rename it Elastic File System. So now that we have NFS, which is called now called the Elastic File System, we've got two options. <coughs> the standard, which is the normal, and the infrequent access, which means lowest cost, but you pay to receive it. And when you set up your network file storage, you can do it in two ways. You can do something called burstable, or, or which is the default, provision throughput. Here's what burstable means. Um, storing my data, all of a sudden I've got extra data and they accommodate me if they have extra capacity for a short period of time. If they have no extra capacity, they don't accommodate me. I just lose it. That's what burstable means. It's being we've been using it in networking forever. Provision throughput by comparison is saying if I need one a certain amount of data, I provision ahead of time and I am guaranteed to receive it. So when you're using the network file system, if you know what you're using, provision it ahead of time. Get the best price the best performance, and of course, your best product. Keep that in the back of your mind. So you've got a burstable option and a provision. You should never leave anything to chance if you know what it's going to be. So realistically speaking, what does this EFS kind of look like or NFS? Quite frankly, you know, it's their managed version of file storage. You take your systems, you mount them, and they all share it. But this is only for Linux and users. Linux and uh, and uh, Unix users, because they use the network file system. Now, there's two other file systems I want to talk about. The first one is file sharing amongst Windows. So this is called the uh, FSX for Windows, or file system for Windows. And what is it? What is this, this Amazon FSX for Windows? Well, guess face it. It's fully managed Windows servers. That's it. So it's a fully, high, a fully managed, highly available Windows file system. Is run on real Windows servers, and therefore it uses the server message block protocol. And because of this, it uses Microsoft file system features, quotas, Active Directory, and of course it can provide that encryption transit at rest kind of thing. So kind of keep that. FSX is just a Windows file server. But of course, you know, you could create your own file server without using any of this. You could basically take a server, any virtual machine, you could mount an EBS volume to it and you can create a share on that. Now you'd have a server message box share just like you would do in the data center. So you could turn any machine into a file server and not use any of this Amazon FSX stuff if you wanted, which I'd probably do in a multi-cloud environment, but you have it. It's a fully managed cloud server. So keep it, as an architect, you're gonna choose what's right for your customer. Sometimes these fully managed services are right. And sometimes they're the worst thing. And in most cases, they're the worst thing because they lock your, customer into something that forces them to be in one cloud, which is a single point of failure, which reduces their agility, bargaining power, and financial performance. So there's lots of reasons to use them and not use them. And we can talk about that too at another time. What's the last file system I want to talk about? Amazon does have one very good high performance file system on the cloud if you really need critical performance. Now this is Amazon FSX for Lustre. 
They call it an ultra performance file system. You can get millions of IOPS, so it gets closer to the data center. They say hundreds of gigabits per second of throughput. Again, you can do that in the data center. Bi-directional synchronization, you can synchronize it with buckets. This is good. How does it happen? It uses these multi-threaded data transfers. So basically it's sending it to multiple things at the same time. That performance is good, real good. And it's enough for your big data, your high performance environments. Okay, next, we have to talk about getting your data to AWS. And this is where we talk about snowballs, snowmobiles, import access services, et cetera, et cetera. So let's uh, see if we've got uh, a couple of questions right now, and then we'll talk about sending data to AWS. That'll probably get us to uh, three o'clock today, but we're gonna keep going. We want you having the fun. We want you all getting cloud hired. So if you're here, hit the like button. If you've not subscribed, please subscribe, hit the bell, tell a friend. And that way you'll be able to see when go back and see new content, tell friends about other content. Plus we love seeing you here. So Chris, if you wanna bring in some questions for me to answer. Mel, it's good to see you. Do you do cross region in a multi-cloud environment? And would it be expensive? Mel, you sure could. Um, but I probably wouldn't. I'd probably use, uh, let's say I was going to use uh, AWS. Maybe I would use Azure on the West Coast, AWS on the East Coast, maybe Google in Europe. I want to know that no matter what I have and where I have it, there's no single points of failure. And by using multi-cloud, it's not going to be more expensive anyway. See what happens, Mel, when you have one cloud provider, and basically you can get negotiate one price. But when you have two cloud providers and you can say to Azure, AWS is giving better pricing. If you don't pay, I'm going to go to Azure and I'll go to AWS and, and deliver a press release that says Azure is too expensive. Guess what? Azure will come down in price. So it's usually cheaper to be able to negotiate with multiple people and have uh, some negotiation and bargaining power. So keep that in your mind. But yes, you could do. Kemi, is the object replication and in CRR, I'm hoping that means cross-region replication. I'm not really a big fan on acronyms because they cause confusion. So if, it, if that's what you're actually asking for, cross-region replication replicates the objects in the bucket. So that would be the same thing. Chris, if you want to bring in the next question. It, it does it in real time. Uh, it does it in real time, yes. Okay. Naga, how do you use similar storage of NFS and AWS? So Same way some, of, in the data center. some of these are may have been before you got to some of the content. Okay. Just yeah, to... so this <laughs> identical to the data center or any other environment. Meaning you mount it um, from the Unix Linux server. Pawan, you can encrypt EBS VMs. Absolutely. And also, can we make a copy? Okay, so can we make a copy of another? Okay, so realistically speaking, you have two options when you've got a server. You can basically just make a EBS volume backup and then launch it as a brand new server. It will be identical, identical with one exception. You'll have a new IP address and a new DNS name because every time it comes up, it's going to have a new IP address. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. But yes, you can encrypt uh, EBS, absolutely. You should encrypt your EBS volume by enabling the key management system. And yes, it's also good to make a copy of all your systems. And you probably should put them in not only one cloud, but you should keep a copy of your systems in a second cloud too. Maybe three. Chris, you wanna bring in the next one? Some of these questions are pretty good. Is cross region default? No, you have to turn it on. Oh, look. Chris, you can bring in the next one. Sorry, I'm, I'm scrolling. That's fine. I'm just. Tushar, I agree with you. I can get for $100 at Best Buy what might cost me thousands of dollars per month on the cloud to be at the same performance. I totally agree with you. Here's the thing. When you go to the cloud, we pay a lot more for everything that we use for the privilege of renting it versus buying it. Having said that, on the cloud too sharp, we pay for what we use. So normally speaking, you know, I'm building a website for a million hits a day, one for one month of the year, or for one week of the year, when they're normally getting, say, a thousand hits a day. 
So by going to the cloud, we pay much more for what we use, but we have the ability to rise up and rise down on demand. So Tushar, as a cloud architect, you're gonna recommend for your clients what makes sense. Here's an example, Tushar. In my house, I run an OpenStack cloud. I have 10 24 core servers with a couple hundred gigs of RAM in each one and NVMe drives. I spec that, oh, that's my personal cloud. I spec running it out on AWS and it was a bit over $12,000 a month. I bought all these used servers for $10,000. So I will keep these servers for three, three years. So at $10,000 divided by three years, you can figure out what I'm paying per month, a couple hundred bucks. AWS wanted 12,000 bucks a month to host my thing. So I built my own private cloud. Now Tushar, if I had an external interfacing website, um, yeah, there's no way I can make a website in the data center cost what it does in the cloud because I got to overbuild in the data center and the cloud, it can cost 10% of that, maybe 5% maybe of the data center. So the key is to Shar as architects, we have to figure out what's in the best interest of our customer. Sometimes the cloud is the best thing in the world and sometimes it's 10 times more expensive and we should never touch it. We need to know what's right for our customers and that's why we ask our customers questions. We do a business case, we provide our LA model because you're right. IOS, IOPS provision ops is charging a bomb. It, it's, it, it's, it's crazy, but it still might be worth it for the customer use case. So it's always an evaluation of the use case. Tushar, let's say I've got 3,000 remote locations. Normally I got to buy 3,000 routers and buy 3,000 private lines. If I'm on the cloud and everybody's connected to the cloud, I can just set up a shared services VPC, which is cheaper. So Tushar, you are 100% correct. AWS is charging way too much for the EBS volumes as a rule compared to traditional storage, but it might still be cheaper for the customer. It's up to us, the architects, to do the business cases. Now, the engineers are going to go be building this. They're not going to be focused on that. We're going to be focused on that. The engineers are going to be configuring this, but we're going to be focused on what costs less, what's the right solution for our customer as architects, cloud architects. Chris, are there any others before I go to the next one? Yes, there's, there's several. In your opinion, and my on-prem infrastructure, you have a NAS location, which is connected to every server. If I move to the cloud, what is the solution of the NAS? That's block storage. EBS volumes are your equivalent of a NAS. That is exactly what they're using. They're using block storage and calling it NAS. It's the equivalent of a NAS. But with the equivalent of a NAS, you might get better performance because it's in your own data center. It's local and lower latency. Raul. Is there any RAID concept in cloud storage services? Yes, I was just teaching you how to do RAID volumes with EBS volumes, and that's why we were teaching that a minute ago. Um, you can't do it with S3 because S3 is not real storage, it's object storage and it doesn't get used by servers. It's just for you to dump your files and stuff and distribute software and backup. But we use RAID volumes and EBS all the time. The reason I was teaching you about RAID volumes and saying it was part of the solution architect profession, not the solution architect associate, is because the performance of the EBS volumes is so bad that if we have any high performance environment in the cloud environment, we have to use RAID. RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 10. We could use RAID 5, but the parity data is just so slow um, and the drive performance is already too slow. The, the instant storage is far, far, far faster than any kind of IO2 block express. I want you to think about it this way. Instant storage, you have eight drives that each give you a million IOPS. That's what you're getting. You've got eight drives that give you 7,000 megabit a second. So you can get 56,000 megabit a second on a RAID volume in a server, which is instant storage. But what you can't get is anything close to that on IO2 Block Express, which is a quarter of a million IOPS. So realistically speaking, we can get 30, 40, 50 times faster with a RAID array than we can um, with any cloud storage if we need to, including the newest, fastest. Amazon FSS for last year, I've not used it, but I will say this, Kajai, there aren't really any high performance th servers that are Windows anywhere in the world. If we look at all the supercomputers, 100% of them are all running Linux. If we look at all the high performance applications, they're all running it. Quite frankly, I haven't seen a Windows server in any production major corporation for anything other than Active Directory or Exchange for 15 years. Um, people are using Linux servers and you know a lot of times when they want to actually store data they still don't even want to use windows servers and they'll use linux servers and they'll be sending up sandbox shares off of them so you know in most cases um kind of keep that in mind ebs volume one server 
elastic file system or network file system, multiple servers using the same data. Kind of remember that. Jeffrey West, what is the possible solution for file replication amongst multiple cloud providers? A properly functioning network, Jeffrey. All you need is a network and you set up your replication on whatever your application is. And you can so select it uh, uh, on 50, 100, 1,000 cloud providers all in a matter of minutes. You just need the network layer reachability information. Just like you're texting a website. If you've got internet access, you can reach it, unless you're blocked by a, somebody blocking your route. When do you use instant storage? Well, the reality is you don't for anything. And here's the why. If you use it and it reboots, you lose it all. So there's, I wouldn't be using it for anything. MRAM Khan, EBS, replacement to NAS. Hooked to multiple EC2 instances. Can you do rewrite to both of them? No. Each one's going to feel like a logical hard drive. If you need to read write to multiple devices at the same time, you're going to have to use the network file system or the server message block protocol. You need real network file systems. Remember, EBS volumes are basically a replacement for NAS, but they're designed to look and feel like a single thing, whereas as opposed to network attack storage. So they're not exactly the same. So no. You can do one at a time. You use uh, the network file system if you want to do more, or which AWS calls the elastic file system because they have to put the word elastic in front of everything. That's the uh, last question related to the current content. Okay, good. Then let's do this. Let's talk about getting our data to AWS because if AWS can store our data, that's great. But if we don't get it there, what kind of use is it going to be? So let's kind of keep that in the back of everybody's mind. So how do we get our data to AWS? Well, there's a lot of ways we can do it. And uh, the first and the easiest way to do it is something called the storage gateway. Nice and easy. So what is a storage gateway? A storage gateway is basically a, a virtual machine that you stick in your data center that acts as a file server. And I'll show you what it looks like, but basically we mount the file server, connect to the file server, and it just pushes everything to the uh, to the cloud. So it's a virtual machine that you'll get from AWS. It can run on your VMware server or Microsoft Hyper-B. It's the perfect disaster recovery environment. It's great for a hybrid cloud. We'll walk you through the types and graphically show you what they do. But I want you to remember when we talk about these storage gateways, we're going to be talking about a couple kinds. We're going to talk about a file gateway. We'll talk about a volume gateway in both stored mode as well as cache mode. And we'll also talk about the tape gateway because these are basically the situations that you have. So the first kind of storage gateway that we have is a file gateway. And this file gateway is an appliance. It's going to act like a file server. It's going to look and feel like a local file server. If we, if we can use the server message block to connect to it from a Windows host, we'll use the NFS protocol to connect to it for our Linux and Unix hosts. And what will happen is we'll write to the storage gateway and the files will be automatically encrypted and transferred to the cloud. So let's look at this environment. I've got this virtual appliance here called the storage gateway. Got my application servers and everything. They're all happy and they store the information on the storage gateway. It hits the storage gateway and the storage gateway says, I have some information, let me send it to the cloud. So it'll take your direct connection or your VPC and it'll send your data to AWS. And now it's in S3. And now if you wanted to have a life cycle policy to take it from standard S3 to infrequent access to Glacier, you could. Storage gateway, file server in a virtual machine that sits in your data center. Connect to the file server via server message block for Windows, NFS for Linux Unix system. Poof, data gets asynchronously replicated to the cloud. Pretty cool stuff. Now, we've got the concept of a volume gateway in stored mode. Now, this is going to be a little different. What I just showed you was, you know, file synchronization. But let's say you have a data center, and you're keeping your data center, and you're predominantly running on a data center, but you want to archive your stuff in real time for the cloud for disaster recovery purposes. Great use for the cloud, disaster recovery. Here's what we do. We set up a volume gateway in stored mode. This is for those of us that are running our active data centers, but we want to copy it to the cloud. So what happens is we mount to this thing, and we constantly store our information on this volume gateway stored mode, and it pushes it over to the cloud. Now, if we want to pull some information, and we pull it to the cloud, and it gets stored on S3. Remember, computers don't mount object storage. 
So by using it this way, we connect to this server and the server translates it to S3. Good. Now we want to pull the information that's stored on S3. Don't worry about it. We go back to the storage gateway. The storage gateway requests it from object storage, sends it back to the storage gateway, and then we pull it. So the storage gateway translates between network file storage that we can use and object storage, which we can. So, you know, kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So Viome Gateway is designed for organizations who keep their data in the data center and it asynchronously backs it up. So you install the storage gateway in a virtual machine, you connect it to the iSCSI protocol, and I'll show you what it looks like. Here you are, you're the user in your data center. Connect, connect to the data center. Data center connects to the storage gateway, and I store a file here, and it gets pushed to S3. And when I need it, it gets pulled to the gateway back to the initiator and sent back to me. So sent to here, initiator, and then it comes right back. Keep that in the back of your mind. On the books, letting you know it takes 15 minutes for our servers to send them to you. So if you're saying something about the book, if you just filled out the form, you won't get that email for upwards of 15 minutes. Our servers intentionally stagger them so they don't end up in your spam folder. So if you're looking for it and you send an email, that possibly is why. So you will get it. Most of the people that send their requests for the books, they, they fill out the form. They send a request three seconds later because I can see when they filled out the form. And I send it to them, and then they get a copy 10 minutes later. So you will get it. And if you don't, reach out to us. We'll make sure we get it to you. So and then check your spam folder or your promotion folder just in case. So now, if the Viome Gateway stored mode pushes your data there, because we're working on it, what about an organization that keeps all their data in S3? Okay. Why would an organization keep their data in S3? It's pretty cheap, right? So it's cheap. Now, if all your data is in S3 and you're in your data center, you can't access that data, which is a problem. But what if we could put that storage gateway there and do something special with it? What if we could mount to the storage gateway and pull all the stuff from the cloud? Hmm. Let's get into the Viome Gateway cache mode because this gets pretty exciting. So here's the way this works. Let's assume most of your data is stored in S3. Here, we put this Viome Gateway cache mode in. The users over here go to their application server. It pulls the information from S3. Now it then gets, because it's not there, it then sent, it gets sent to the storage gateway, which caches the information, just like a content delivery network, and then sends the request. Now there's another user that wants to access that network. Guess what? They go here and it's already cached on the, over here and it gets sent back. Then the next user requests it, it's already cached. So now we're pulling information out of object storage, sending it to our data center, making it feel like file storage in the form of a network file storage system and pulling it down, and we're caching data. So the Viome Gateway cache mode is exceptionally good. It's exceptionally good for the following reasons. And yes, we're recording this. Uh, it's exceptionally good for the following reasons. You can connect to the cloud environment, cache your information so it's gonna save network bandwidth, and it's gonna save multiple, multiple clouds. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Now, there are other ways that you can actually get your data to AWS. You can use something called the snowball. And basically, a snowball is this ruggedized computer, real rugged. And in the book, download the book, you'll get to see much more about it, read about it, see what they look like. It's a specialty secure so it's a system that's got a whole bunch of hard drives and it is ruggedized. And it's got a big 10 gig network card. So what do you do? You order this thing from AWS, you request it. They ship you this giant ruggedized computer. What do you do? You plug it into your network, you copy your data on the computer, and then you ship, call AWS, and they pick it up and ship it back to them. So take your data, ship it onto this encrypted high-performance device, and then you sh and ship it back to AWS, and they stick it on S3 for you. And then once it's on S3, you can do it. So the snowball is the way that if you've got a lot of data to get there, you use it. Now, snowballs are 80 terabytes in size. Guess what? That's not that much. And when you format it, there are 10, there's 72 terabytes of usable data. So guess what? If you have to, you might need three or four or 30 or 40 of these things. So kind of remember that. So let's talk about that. We like that. And those are the reasons why we like it. And we like it so much. So let's keep going. So we've got our snowball. 
And now we know why we have the snowball. The snowball's data is encrypted. Now let's say we have a lot of information, like really, like petabytes of storage. Well, you know, how are we gonna get it there? We could send it over the direct connection, but it's gonna take forever. Or we can basically request a snowmobile. And here's what snowmobile is. Basically, AWS drives a tractor trailer to you. And then there's a huge shipping competitor that's, that's capable of storing 100 petabytes of storage. It's a data center on wheels. They drive this tractor trailer to you. You copy all your stuff to that data center. They drive it back on the tractor trailer, dump it on an S3, and now all your stuff has moved to AWS fast. That's called the snowmobile. So we've got the snowball, which is a ruggedized computer, the snowmobile, which is this giant, giant, giant tractor trailer full of storage of computers. And now we've got something called the import export service. Now the import export service is very, very simple stuff. What is the import export service? Let's talk about it very quickly. Basically it's a rental hard drive from AWS. You plug it into your systems, you copy your data and you ship it back to them and move it to S3. So import export service, ruggedized, or basically hard drive, snowmobile, big giant tractor trailer, snowball, ruggedized computer with 10 gigabit ethernet interface um, that can store 80 terabytes raw, 72 terabytes formatted. While we're on storage, let's talk about Amazon WorkDocs. It's not something you're gonna hear about a lot, but just in case it shows up on an exam, I want you prepared. So Amazon WorkDocs is a fully managed, secure content creation, storage, and collaboration service. So Dropbox, Google Drive. It enables collaboration on created projects. It enables shared document sharing. It's simple and affordable. It can be accessed via the web or client software. It works with Windows and Mac OS clients, and it meets all your traditional storage security environments such as HIPAA, PCI, DSS, ISO, et cetera, et cetera. So what did we talk about today in the storage? We talked about block storage, object storage, and file storage. We talked about the AWS branded form of object storage, which is S3. We talked about EBS or block storage, which is the AWS branded version of block storage. We talked about um, the Elastic File System, which is the AWS branded version of um, network file systems, Sun's network, Sun now Oracle's systems, Oracle network, Oracle's uh, Sun Microsystems slash now Oracle's network file system. Um, we talked about RAID and RAID 0 and RAID 1 and RAID 5 and RAID 10. We talked about the file system for Windows. We talked about storage gateways today. We talked about snowballs. We talked about snowmobiles, the import export service, and work ducks. We talked today about, uh, we talked about uh, the architecture of the cloud. We talked about the region versus the availability zone versus the local zone in the data center today. We identified edge locations and talked heavily about what those are. We're gonna cover it much, much, much more. We talked about a pure cloud versus a multi-cloud versus a hybrid cloud and the advantages and disadvantages of each. We talked about VPN connections, direct connections. We talked a lot about IPsec. And we talked about some high availability principles and a lot about the direct connections and the direct connections and how they work. So got some time. We can answer some questions. Let's close some of these things very good. Um, so I want to let you know that we're going to be doing the following. We're going to be sharing links to lab walkthrough videos tonight. I want to make this clear. Why did we focus the course the way we did? We are an architecture focused organization and architects design. So we're gonna spend a lot of time on the design, but you still have to pass an exam and there's still people that wanna be cloud engineers where they're gonna be getting any hands-on versus cloud architects like me. So each night moving forward, we're gonna be releasing a video with labs. So please check back tonight, please look for it. Please look for the labs, they'll be there. This content is gonna be up and we're not taking it down. So do the following. Um, go back and watch any sections. Make sure you download that book. The link to that book is in the description below. Download it and here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna get a link to download. It's not gonna be an attachment because every day I answer about 40 or 50 emails that were people saying I don't, they send me the email they received that says I don't know where the book is and I say, please read the second sentence where it says download here. And then people find it because I want you all to get it because I want you all to get cloud hired. So 
All future videos are going to be released on this channel, so subscribe and hit the bell. If you don't hit the bell, you won't receive that notification that that new video is there. So everybody, please subscribe and hit the bell. Now, um, I can take some questions, so please hit the light, please subscribe, please hit that bell, and I'm going to open some, some more questions. I can stay a little bit longer, answer some questions. I'm always happy to do whatever I can to help you guys out. So, any questions for me? Yes, there are. Give me just a second. Let's, let's, let's answer them as many as we can, Chris. This one came in right before you started, so I don't, I, I've been slightly distracted. One so last doubt. It's a good question. Could you use an instance store with the spot instance to run a batch job? You could, but if your batch is terminated for any reason on a spot instance, you lose everything. And it's on instance storage, so you're really in trouble. So reality is... Spot instances, you got to be really, really careful to use them, whether you call them preemptible instances on Google or spot instances. Remember, you're bidding on unused capacity. And if that capacity goes up by one penny, you're shut down. And if everything you do is on instant storage, then you're really stuck because you lose it all. So I probably wouldn't do it for those reasons. Unless it's something that you can do a batch job that you know is going to be over in 30 minutes. And if it fails, you don't care. You can rerun it and pay for it a second time. I wouldn't do it. Is the storage gateway on a VM the same as on the ESXi's host as your applications and file servers? Well, the storage gateway is going to be a VM, which you're typically going to host in your VMware ESXi servers or your Microsoft Hyper-V environment. So yes, exactly. It's a pre-made virtual machine. They call it an appliance. It's a great question. Chris, you want to bring in the next one? Kajoy. Can I give you an example of an Empire Expert service? Sure. Good joy. Um, go to Best Buy, go buy a four terabyte hard drive, sync your files on it, and go ship it to someone. That's the import export service. It's a regular cheap hard drive that you're just sending out to them. That's exactly the import export service. And this next one, I feel like we need to address Dragos. An architect still needs hand on. You can't be a great car architect without writing a single line of code. Dragos, I've been an architect now for 25 years. I've never written a single line of code. If I, if I, and this is really, really important. Architect is not hands-on. I've been an architect forever. My students graduate every day, and they don't touch the tech. Whether they're at AWS, whether they're at Bearing Point, they're not touching the tech. Here's the thing. I, architect needs to go to the customer and ask them about their business. They need to know so much about their business they can make recommendations about the business. How do we increase sales? How do we decrease expenses? How do we improve collaboration? How do we get our customers? If we're focusing on coding, we don't know how to do any of that. So I've never written a line of code and I've designed billion dollar architects, architectures, and I get offers from every cloud provider every single day. If I was busy writing code, I wouldn't be hired as an architect. I'd be hired as a software developer. In fact, Dragos, we get people cloud hired every day. When I get software developers and they have a bunch of certifications and a bunch of coding on there, They've been going on these cloud architect interviews for months and they can't seem to get hired. And then what I do, I take the resumes and they have all this coding and I get rid of all of it. And I change it with architect things. And the architect things are improved uh, sales by 11% by improving the website. Decreased downtime by 22% through the introduction of this. Increased customer satisfaction by X, Y, Z percent. Business transformation, including this. We start pushing the business acumen. That person gets hired a day later, and they don't get hired for $100,000 a year. They're getting hired for $300,000 a year. So Dragos, do you want to be the person that codes all day, in which case is really a cloud engineer, and that's fine? Or do you want to be the architect that's the executive that meets with the CEO and designs their system? The choice is up to you. You can choose any kind of career you want. But if you're designing a building that's 1,000 meters tall as an architect, you can't be the guy or the girl cutting the grass, because if you're focusing on the grass, you can't see the building. If you're trying to fly an airplane as a pilot, you can't be in the back of the plane handing out your drinks to the people and making sure your people are in their seats. And then if the pressure gets, cabin gets depressurized, you can put their oxygen. Pilot flies the plane. I've worked as a doctor and a nurse, Dragos, and let me tell you, I can see the patient as a doctor. I can walk into the hospital, evaluate them. And then I gotta go evaluate my next patient. If I'm busy starting IVs and doing things like the nurse would do, I'm not evaluating my patients. I'm doing somebody else's job. So Dragos, 
it's not whether you want to be a software developer. All my architects that get hired by AWS every day and by Google and by Azure, they don't code. None of them. They're architects. Architects don't code. So you can have your job, you can do your job anyway. But you know, the second half of your question is, well, how if you don't know how to code or you can design an architecture? Well, here's the thing. My architectures aren't going to include any coding. That's what the software developers I'm going to do. I'm going to be focused on their network, the IP addressing, the routing, what my load balancers need to look like, what my servers need to look like, what my storage needs to look like, where my firewalls need to be, where my IDS, IPS. I got a big picture to worry about. So I need to focus on the business. I need to focus on the transformation. I need to focus on the design. And you can't fly an airplane and hand out drinks at the same time. You can't mow the lawn and do construction at the same time. You can't design a building and be cleaning up the basement at the same time. You got to look at the big picture. So if you were to go outside and look at the moon in a telescope right now with a zoom in 200 times X, well, you, you can see the craters in the moon. It looks beautiful. But you can't see the stars in the sky. So drag goes. If you want to be an architect, you need to be way, way, way removed from hands-on. Because if you're hands-on, you're not doing any design and you're not helping your customers, you can't improve their business, you can't uh, evaluate the business, you can't evaluate what the employers are doing, their workflows, you can't do anything other than code. So it's up to you. But uh, our architects that get hired don't code. Is the storage gateway connected to the Direct Connect? Sandman Ahmed, um, anytime you have network layer reachability, you can access it. So direct connections or VPNs, and that's an exceptionally good question. Melody, when migrating data to a snowball, can you use it to recover data just in case you have an attack on your on-premise environment? Sure. That's called disaster recovery. Asaya, what is the difference between data recovery and data storage? Data storage is where you put your stuff. Data recovery is what happens to your environment. How do you get your data afterwards? So let's say you've got a hard drive. You drop the hard drive down the stairs. Data recovery is repairing the drive to pull your data. Data storage was storing it in the drive in the first place. But excellent, good, excellent question. Meyer, for storage, is throughput factor important only IPS? Well, it depends what your use case is. Meyer, if I had to move uncompressed video to you, and two hours of uncompressed video is five terabytes of data, the throughput matters because the speed that I can send and read and write is the most critical. IOPS has nothing to do there at all. It's irrelevant. Now, if I needed to read and write to a database a thousand times a second or a million times a second, but I was only writing a kilobyte at one time, guess what? I don't need a lot of throughput, but I need a lot of IOPS. So as architects, we have to ask the business requirements, the application requirements, and from that we'll determine what we need. But only when we're there, which is the reason I say you can't be hands-on, because Getting these requirements could take you weeks on site speaking to the right people. And you need to be talking to people, not hiding in a basement, configuring things, or you won't know what to design. You'll, you'll know what to configure like a cloud engineer, which will be beautiful. But you won't be helping your customers. You won't be transforming their business because you're not going to know what to make to help them. So you really got to take a step back. That's why we architects are big picture people. Um, Chris, you want to bring in the next one? What do you get from the Cloud Architect Career Program? You get hired as a Cloud Architect when you're done, um, quite simply. Um, there's a big difference between certification and getting hired. Certification is more about the name of the service and how they configure it. But we Cloud Architects are architects. We're business executives. So you know, with the Cloud Engineer, they're really technical. With that technical architect, they're also technical. With that solution architect, they're 50% technical, 50% business. That cloud architect is probably 60% business, 40% technical. And that enterprise architect is 80% tech business and 20% technical. So we teach people how to get hired. We take them in. We teach them what is the cloud. We teach them how to design on the cloud. We teach them how to present, uh, how to write up an architecture, how to sell an architecture, how to do the ROI modeling of the architecture to convince the customer they need it, how to design it, what to design, how to design the security, all the stuff that's not covered. So realistically speaking, our program is 500 hours, and in the 500 of the hours is related to certification training for the Certified Solution Architect Professional, and the other 480 hours is there. But it's not just that. It's that I have my students building clouds. There's a family environment. I've got you know 
100 of my students in, in this message right now. And I bet you 100 of those students would tell you how much they love each other, how much they work each other, how much a family they are. You ask one of my students a question at 2 o'clock in the morning, and there's going to be somebody in some part of the world that's going to do it. Because there's going to be someone in Asia, someone in the Middle East, someone in Africa, someone in India, someone in Pakistan, someone in Colombia, someone in Brazil, someone anywhere in the world to, to, to go through your answers. So there's that. But most importantly, we do live instruction twice per week. We teach architecture, which is not what we're teaching now. Then we have, uh, we have uh, 500 hours of training. And then my students do labs. They work with server virtualization, containers, firewalls. All my students even build their own cloud. And then my, all my students get an internship that's included things that they can tell the hiring manager doing. So all my students get cloud hired. So that's what we're looking for, what we're doing. And that's why we created our career development program. And every day, one of my students gets hired. And that's why we like the hashtag cloud hired. So hit the like button, hit the comment. If you guys have more questions, Okay, you're not clear the difference between a Bastion host and a VPC pairing. A Bastion host is the worst security violation in the entire world and something you should never consider. The only time you'll ever see that in real life is on a certification exam and the concept of Bastion host and jump host, we got rid of about 20 years ago because it was a massive, massive, massive security problem. And I will, if you guys want, I can show you why. Now, the concept of VPC pairing is how do you connect two different VPCs, which is totally different. There will be a substantial amount of time that we actually spend on that section. What are we going to cover tomorrow? Well, we're going to keep covering stuff that's related to this curriculum, which means what does that look like? I don't know how far we're going to get based upon how many questions. Um, but it will still be related to this curriculum. So what's next on the curriculum, I can tell you, is after we cover that we covered storage, and after storage, we're going to be talking about compute. So we'll be getting involved in containers, for example, and virtual machines, and how to build your servers and what they need to be. And we're also going to get into databases, and we're going to have a lot of fun with the different kinds of databases to use. So that's what we're going to cover tomorrow. Hey, Mike, I just realized that tomorrow is Wednesday. Yes. And on Wednesday mornings, we do this pretty cool thing on our YouTube channel for people with career questions. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I, for I forgot what day of the week it was. <laughs> tomorrow, that's right, between 9 and, say, 11, 1130 tomorrow, we're going to let you bring in your questions, how to get hired, anything related to building your best cloud architect career or solution architect career, because I want everybody getting cloud hired. So we will spend, uh, we will basically cover all of these concepts. Yeah, and those, and are, your, like th th those are your questions that you have. About Any your questions career. that you guys want on how to build your career, we'll cover. What yep. to do on an interview, how to build your resume, what the hiring managers want, anything career related we will touch tomorrow between a not tech career. Is doing the SACO2 going to help someone on the security special exam? So I've got two recommendations. One, never do the AWS security specialty exam. And here's the reason why. No one cares, and it's too basic for anybody to think of it as anything. No one's going to consider you a security person. So if you want to do cloud security, I recommend getting the CISSP, the CCSP, or the CEH master. I would not waste my time, my effort, or my money on any AWS specialty exams. They won't get you hired, they won't get you promoted, and they won't get anybody else to think you're anything about security. So they'll have no impact on your salary employability in any way. But if you get the CISSP, the CCSP, or the CEH master, it's going to have employers coming to you, looking for you to be their cloud security architects. Now, will doing the SACO2 without it, reality is you're probably never going to be able to work on the cloud environment. Um, you have to have some certification unless you're a Cisco certified internet expert, for example, or um, you know, you've been out there for about 20 years in networking and data center. Otherwise, you're going to need a cloud cert and it's going to be the certified solution architect professional, which starts with the certified solution architect associate. But this will help because you know, we're going to cover some security things. But remember, when we do AWS security specialty, what is it really? It's working around the AWS limitations and teaching you how to use non-AWS stuff which we teach my students how to use all the time. So keep that in your mind. So this will definitely help you and increase your employability dramatically, but I would not do the security specialty exam. 
I don't think it's a good use of your time, effort, or money. And I recommend my students not do that. How do you design an architecture without coding? Okay, very simply. So if I have a, a, a one hour conversation with the CEO and he tells me about their business, what do I do? I now know what the end state's supposed to look like. Now what I do, I bring in 50 cloud engineers and they're gonna baseline the organization systems. Now I'm gonna design an architecture. What is the architecture gonna look like? It's gonna look like the networking connectivity. It's gonna have the security in it. It's gonna have the virtual machines. It's gonna have the servers. The same as every architect does. And you know what I'm done with that? I don't, once I've done that design, and with, if you're working for Accenture or Bearing Point or AWS or Google, here's what you're gonna do. You designed it. Now, once it's designed, you gotta present it back to the customer. You gotta sell the customer. Now, once you've done that, you're done. You leave, you're out of there. Now it gets handed over to a team of cloud engineers to go build it, and they build it, and they will code. It'll be a cloud engineer, maybe it gets sent to a DevOps team to automate the release. And then once it's all built, they give it to the maintenance people, which are called the sysops people. So architect designs, engineer builds, and then the uh, maintenance people, the sysops people take over. So it's like the pilot. When he he's flying that plane, <laughs> he or she's not out there handing out drinks. They have people for that. So my people that get, I have students that graduate every day and they're like, Mike, am I ever gonna touch the tech? I've been an architect for six months. Companies bought me a new car. I made $300,000 this year, but I haven't touched the tech once this year. And I say, you're never going to. And they say, what do you mean? And I say, well, I was the lead network architect. I was an, a lead network engineer for a while and I touched my routers. And then I became a lead network architect and I designed things. I talked to things, I presented things. I presented to conferences, I wrote. And I got paid well to do it because that's what we architects do. You've got an architect that designs a building. That person is not the construction crew. The architect that designs the building isn't there with bricks and cement. The management consultant that designs new work, business workflows, who's that's called the business architect, guess what? They're not actually you know, doing the work, they're designing it. The CEO sets the strategy for a business. Do you think the CEO is coding or do you think the CEO hires programmers? Engineers can't design. Why can't the engineers design? They have to ask the customer, what drives the tech? The customer's business. What is the customer's business problem that you're trying to solve? Do they need more sales? Do, do, because, you know, what are we trying to increase? Top line revenue? Or are we trying to increase uh, expenses to improve employee productivity? That's what we architects focus on, which means you need to have MBA kind of business knowledge. You need to have business executive presentation skills. You need to have business executive leadership skills. You have to have extreme levels of emotional intelligence, writing, all of that, ROI modeling. That's what we architects do. I hate to say it, but once I left engineering into architecture, that was the last time I touched the tech. And all the architects that I've trained, they don't touch tech. They don't get near it. They design tech. Engineers build it. So building architect, designer, engineer, construction crew. Kind of keep it that way, and then you'll always know how the vision gets done. And the problem is why people don't get hired. I get people that come to me every day. They've been working, spending years trying to get hired. And they're learning Python, which I don't need in my architects. They're learning SysUp. They're learning DevOps. And then they go on an interview, and I expect a business transformation specialist. And they want to tell me about the cutting. And it's like, um, if I need a software developer, I'll hire a software developer. I get literally 100 plus emails every day saying, do you need software serv software people? And I say, we're an architecture firm. And they say, do you need software development? And I'm like, no. Um, if I if I was an implementation firm, I wouldn't need software developers, but I'm an architecture firm. We're designers. People pay us to design their systems, not to build them. There's other people for that. But it's a great question there, Fruitful Living. And love the grapes in the background, too. When will you need to use pre-signed URLs as opposed to a signed cookie? You use a pre-signed URL with S3 when you want to pre-sign it with the key to get it to people as fast and easy as possible. So... That's what we're using is the pre-signed URLs. Chris, you want to bring in the next one? Uh, I'm here. Give me just a second. Yeah, so some of these are starting to get into career, but I definitely think we should uh, should address them. I can I can go a little longer if you have yeah, the time, you Chris. Just, yeah, you just let me know when you need to stop. Today, I'm, I'm, I'm good okay. today. 
a QA job, you're looking at something that says some knowledge in AWS, Docker, and digital certificates. Is this boot camp appropriate? Well, it'll give you lots of knowledge in AWS. So yes, we'll even talk about certificates. So totally. But remember, QA is about testing and architecture is about system designing. So it will help you. It will help you move out of QA into architecture roles if you desire that which will give you much more career potential, much more advancement and a much, much, much higher salary. Usually, but it, people usually in QA are looking for me to get them out of QA. Um, but you know, if you're in QA, the more you know about AWS, it's gonna be helpful. And the more you know about certificates, it'll be helpful. And we will address containers too. That'll also be helpful. But great question there. I had lots of friends that worked in QA. They were really, really smart. Does a cloud architect need to have good networking knowledge? Extreme. So networking and data center knowledge are the only two technical skills a cloud architect needs to have. The rest of what they need to have is business acumen, leadership, emotional intelligence, sales skills, ROI modeling, um, the knowledge, how to deal with the personalities. You know, that, that's what we're dealing with. So, yes, because if you, have the if you don't have the network, you have nothing. So what is the cloud? It's a virtual network and a data center. If we go back 30 years, so like AWS likes their new advancements. Last month, AWS invented east-west routing. Cisco did it in 1980. Um, what else is very recent? You know, when I start looking at some of these things, east-west routing or routing in between subnets. Everything that we do on the cloud is 30-year-old network technology, every last thing. There's nothing new that I've seen in the cloud that I didn't work with 25 years ago working in networking as a network architect, which is why if you go to AWS, Google, and Azure, you're going to see a bunch of CCIs like me that have no concept of coding, no concept of any of that hands-on stuff whatsoever other than designing networks. And they're hired as principal and distinguished architects by the cloud providers every day because the people that have the most knowledge in the network are the people that are by far, by far, by far the best cloud architects. Because if you don't have good networking, your systems fall apart. And the network is always the failing part. You saw it at Facebook. They had one networking person that didn't know what they did. They lost $8 billion in one day from an outage. And it caused so much brand damage that instantly they're no longer Facebook, they're meta. So you look at AWS that had an impaired network, guess what? If they had better networking people, they wouldn't have networking problems. So the network architects are the most critical people. They are very well paid and they are in extreme demand. And if you're a cloud architect with networking skills, I could get you hired by the end of the week. If you had good CCNP to CCI, skills. How would a MySQL database get migrated to the cloud? Well, here's what I would do. If I had my MySQL database sitting on a VMware server, I would make a copy of that virtual machine. I would then send it to S3 and I would relaunch it as a new instance and I have my system there in seconds. Or you could use one of the AWS managed databases or you could just do it yourself. You can get any virtual machine on any cloud, which is what I would do. I would install the MySQL database and copy my data over, and that's what I would use. But um, remember, databases are computers. Computers can't use object storage. So we can transfer it to them with object storage. But after that, we got to pull it from object storage and relaunch a computer or a server, which is always going to be on block storage. That is a fantastic question, XBLMA. Excellent question. That's a great question. Please tell me a little bit more about volatile and non-volatile storage. Vo Chacuzzi, that's a great question. Volatile storage goes away with reboot. Non-volatile storage doesn't. So instant storage, you reboot your system, it's all gone and it's dead. And we can address the Kafka question because that's a very good question that I see. I want to make sure we address that. So that's the difference yeah. Jacuzzi, between volatile and non-volatile. But we'll get to it in time, Chris. Just make sure we address the why people, um, for example, why people are not using Kinesis and they're using Kafka and other things. Do we help an Azure architect? Of course we do, Vibu. We never design a single cloud. Every one of our students in our cloud architect career development on every architecture they do every week is a minimum on two to three clouds. So. I don't believe in an Azure architect. I don't believe in an Azure AWS architect. I create cloud architects and I get them hired. Here's why. I want you to think about this. Let's say we're in a car. Am I on my steering wheel? Is my gear shift? There's a car in front of me. Honk, honk, honk. We're all having fun. We're driving. I'm listening to the radio. I'm listening to Bob Marley. All is good. So 
Now I'm in my car and I call this thing that I'm turning a steering wheel. I call this thing an accelerator and I call this thing a brake. And I learn how to drive a car. Now, Vibu, I could do it the other way around and I could have an elastic rotational turner or rounder and I could learn the elastic rotational turner or rounder, change direction. Then I can have an elastic, improve your speed, but reduce your uh, gas performance. And I've got this other thing that's called the elastic slow downer service. And I've got this other thing called the elastic magical drive change selection services for the gear show. Now, if I only know what the elastic magical rotational device is, I don't know how to drive. I only know how to drive that. But if, you're, if I learn that this is a steering wheel and I get into a Mercedes, it's still a steering wheel. And if I get into a Honda, it's still a steering wheel. And if I get into this, it's still a steering wheel. So if I learn how to drive, it works. So by the way we're teaching it, by teaching the object storage before we mention S3, by saying it's Microsoft Blob, it's the same training. It's the same thing. Only thing is the names change, but everything else is identical. And that's a great question. So yes, we work with all clouds. There's no such thing as a single cloud provider. Only 3% of customers, 3% are insane enough to use a single cloud provider. So if you want a job, you have to know how to work on all clouds. That doesn't mean you need to be certified on all clouds, but you need to know the cloud, not a cloud. Chris, you want to bring in the next one? Any training concentrations on data analytics, big data? Um, yes, I have uh, a special architect that's working on that. Big data analytics people, you know, understand that if you don't have any background in this, big, big, big things to learn. Now, your data analytics people are different than architects because they have to know a lot. They don't. They focus on the databases. They focus on the Kafka's. They focus on the streaming data. These people need to know a lot about mapping and reduction, which is typically Python Spark scripts. They need to about know about SQL databases and no SQL databases. Let's face it, we're not going to be using any of the name branded services for any of these. We're going to have to do things to make it work. So, you know, kind of keep that in mind. But yes, we we are in development of a big thing for that, but it is a special career. But realize the data careers are much harder to get than these architecture careers. Chris, you want to bring in the next one? Chris, I'll be waiting for you to bring in the next one when you find it. What is employability of associate architects? Okay, so Cafe Memories. I want you to understand this. Here's what a certification does. It invites you to the party, meaning it helps you actually get an interview. So the... What does it take to get the interview? Typically speaking, it takes the certified solution architect professional, not the associate. Having said that, I interviewed a thousand AWS certified solution architect professionals, and not a single one was actually capable of functioning as a cloud architect. So what gets you hired? Knowledge of the network in the data center, business acumen, emotional intelligence, leadership capabilities, executive presence, and emotional intelligence. So that's what gets you employed. Technical competency, yes. Knowing what you know and you don't know. Your attitude, your energy, and enthusiasm. When someone thinks you're willing to work, or go above and beyond. That's what they're looking for. It has nothing to do with your certification. Your certification will get you a job interview, but it won't get you hired. It doesn't matter what certifications you have. It won't get you hired. The exception is the Cisco Certified Internet Expert. And here's the reason why. It's about 75,000 pages of networking reading to, re to pass the Cisco Certified Internet Expert exam. It's about 200 pages of reading for the AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate exam. So 75,000 pages versus 200 pages. So when you start to see that, you see why the CCIEs like me and the CCDEs like me, we go out there and the world comes to us because we have that architecture knowledge. We know not to, to get bogged down in the details. We have the knowledge to get to the details, but we focus on the big picture because we've been designing billion dollar systems for years because they're all coming to us. So. Really, it's about your knowledge, your capability, your architectural knowledge, your business acumen, your emotional intelligence, your leadership. You can have all the technical skills in the world, and if you don't have those other skills, the business acumen leadership, you're still a cloud engineer. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Is networking a prerequisite for our cloud architect course? There are zero prerequisites for our cloud architect course because we have 500 hours to teach everything we need. No prerequisites, and our students get hired every day. Last week, in the last two weeks, I had two people. One was working as a food server that got hired by AWS, 
and the other person had a completely non-tech job. It was some other, you know, industry job. Both hired by AWS with zero background in tech, zero experience in tech, and it was just last week. And it happens to me every day. But no, I teach all that's necessary. Brad, is the CCN, CCSP the same as the CCNP security cert? Not even close. The CCSP is, a, a, is from a, a security body, and the CCNP security cert is from Cisco. I love Cisco, but Cisco is not who I'd go to for security certifications. Cisco is who I would go for networking certifications. I would go to the ISC2 for uh, network for security certifications, and that's where I would get the CISSP, which I held for many, many years, or the CSP, CCSP from. But if you've got the experience, the CISSP is by far the best one. Now, there are other good security certifications that are out there, but they don't hold value with the employers. unless uh, So because they hold less value from the employers, we're not looking for them. Chris, you want to bring in the next one? I don't know how to answer that on Najib. Um, so let's move on to the next one. Gabriel, so good to see you. The tech question is, is what I call the struggle point. Coming from a tech background, we all fall into a pit and learn all the unnecessary skills that are not relevant for architecture. That's the problem. The biggest problem I have is when somebody wants to learn all these other skills. And the problem is they put all these other skills and certifications on their resume. Then the hiring manager looks at him and says, who are you? Are you the maintenance person from SysOps? Are you a DevOps engineer? Are you a software developer? Are you a database person? You're no architect, but what the heck are you? So Gabriel, it's really funny. Um, I had a really good student. He was one of my most technical ever. And he was the one that had to put down all his coding and all his security certifications and, uh, and all of these things. Um, so realistically speaking, he went, he applied for job. They, he's like, Mike, they keep asking me about my coding. And he's like, I'm not really a coder. I'm like, but I have a little bit. I said, get rid of all that garbage. A couple of weeks later, he's hired, working on the Google Cloud, getting paid an unbelievable amount of money, happy beyond his belief. Why was this special student um, so good? Because he had all the business acumen, the leadership, the emotional intelligence. He's an amazing architect. Absolutely amazing. But it wasn't until... We stripped off all the non-architecture stuff that the people would even see him as an architect because he built himself a developer brand, not an architect. So Gabriel, if you want to be a doctor, you go to medical school. If you go to school for house cleaning and then school for networking and then school for law, the world doesn't really think you're a doctor. They think you're everybody else. So it's the same thing. So yes, Gabriel, I'm an engineer. When I was younger, I focused into all those things and it held me back. It wasn't until my manager asked me, Mike, you know the difference between a $100,000 engineer and a $300,000 architect? I'm like, tell me, tell me, tell me, please, right now. And he said, it's business acumen, it's leadership, it's emotional intelligence. My manager then proceeded to say to me, he's like, you're not like the regular engineers. And I said, what do you mean? He says, you communicate differently, write differently. Would you like to go to leadership training? And I said, yes, and I did. Changed my life overnight. So that's the key um, to do it. So Chris, you want to bring in the next one? Now you're confused. You want to switch to cloud AWS. You think about being an architect or an engineer. Kumar, you figure out whichever job you want. Engineers, hands-on technical. Work all day, coding, configuring. Good. They get to stay hands-on technical. The architect can pay two and three times more to not have to do any of the coding, to not have to do any of the configuring, to be doing a lot more presentations, buying a lot more lunches, a lot more dinners, a lot more drinks. I'd rather, me, me personally, I, I don't like to get my hands dirty anymore. I like to buy people lunch, give a speech, write a paper, and get paid twice as much money to do it. But there are engineers that love to be engineers, and they love to get technical. And when I was in my 20s and 30s, when I left medicine and was first an engineer, if you would have told me that I was going to take a position where I was going to write white papers and make PowerPoints to give presentations, I would have wanted to die. I was so interested in configuring BGP all day long. So... It's not which is the better career. They're both great. An architect like me that's a system designer is worthless without a cloud engineer because I can make the biggest, most beautiful blueprints in the world. But guess what? If there's nobody to build it, it's nothing. So they're both equally important. It's what makes you happy. So let's keep that. Chris, if you can bring in the next one. So I'm not going to bring in the next one, but I've got... Uh a couple uh several around the same idea okay. it's 
and, and, and it's geared towards the individual. Several people have asked, after this boot camp, will I be ready for the exam? How long does it take for me to be prepared for the exam? So different variations of that same type of okay. question. So I'm going to give you three answers. <laughs> Read this book, take this course, and get a practice test from Andrew Brown from Free Code Camp. I even believe it's free. And you'll be set to pass the exam. That's all you need. Now, how long does it take? Look, I could take, I could, I, I could get all of you right now, and I could give you two websites, and I could get every one of you 10x AWS certified by the end of next week, and none of you would know anything about anything, because passing the exam is easy, and that's why the certifications alone are not enough. There are multiple sites on the internet that sell identical copies of the exam, and anytime you see anybody that's got more than two or three AWS certifications, you know exactly what they've been cheating. So. That's why multiple certifications, typically we even avoid them. Like somebody wanted a job for me. They're like, I'm seven XAWO certified. I said, you're seven times too many certified. I need an expert. I need someone capable. I need someone focused. If you've learned Alexa and you think you know security and you think you know databases and you think you know networking and you think you know this, I know you don't. Why? Because after 25 years focused on networking, I know that there's so much more to learn. And of all the original Cisco certified internet experts, and I had to read that 75,000 pages and I did it, and I've been designing billion dollar architectures for all these years. Guess what? After 25 years, I've only worked in BGP and multicast on the network. I picked 5% of the networking and spent 25 years there. And that's why the world comes to me as an expert versus a jack of all trades and a master of none. But that's the key. So it's up to you. It's up to you how you build your career. As an expert, as a jack of all trades, as an expert, you're going to get paid a lot more. As a jack of all trades, you're going to get paid a lot less. As, a as an expert, the world comes to you. As a jack of all trades, it doesn't. But you have to pick your career. If you're like me, I like knowing a lot about BGP because it's fun for me. And I don't like to spend a lot of time on a little of a lot of things. So I know a lot about well, one thing. But how you do that, how you build your career is up to you. So, But it could be very quick. That's my advice on how to pass it. And you're going to pass the exam and do really good and actually know something. Why is Kafka more preferred over Kinesis? So that is an extremely good question. So when we go through the certification, we're going to talk about things like Kinesis and WAF and DynamoDB. And the reality is, in real life, we're probably never going to use them. And here's why we can't use them. No, almost nobody, I should say 97% of organizations, aren't crazy enough to actually use a single cloud provider. Now, a year ago, 29% of organizations thought a single cloud provider with multiple AZs and regions was acceptable. And now only 3% are crazy enough to think they can go on a single cloud provider. So when you use multiple cloud providers, you can't use a service like DynamoDB. You can't use a service like AWS WAF. You can't use something Kinesis. You can't use Aurora. You can't use any of this proprietary anything. And you need to use standards. So I'm going to use Kines I'm going to use Kafka in my Azure, Google, data center, and AWS cloud at the same time. And if I need a firewall, I'm not going to be using WAF because it's not going to be interoperable with anything else. It's probably not going to be enterprise grade either. I'm going to take a network load balancer, a gateway load balancer in front of a bunch of industrial grade firewalls, maybe Palo Alto firewalls, Cisco firewalls, Fortinet firewalls, TechWin firewalls. And I'm going to be deploying the same thing in all clouds. So what you're going to see is all these providers make up these fancy services with these great names. And they're good services, but they lock you into the single cloud and make it impossible for you to leave meaning you could spend $50 million to have somebody recode your applications to move to these proprietary services. And if AWS raises your rates, you might have to spend another 50 million to move them to Azure, where by going to multiple clouds at the same time, guess what? You don't have any of this to worry about. So that's why people use Kafka. That's why you're not gonna find many clients using DynamoDB. That's why if they're big customers, they're gonna be using multi-clouds, they're not gonna be using WAF, they're not gonna be using Aurora. They're gonna use MongoDB, which they can deploy across all the clouds, or Oracle, which they can deploy on all the clouds. So when it comes to building high availability, high performance multi-cloud networks, all that vendor proprietary stuff all goes away. And that's why we're not going to be using Kinesis for many things, even though it's a great service. It's the vendor lock-in piece and the proprietary piece. Of course, were there any more? Yes. Because I want to get everybody too tired. I want to make sure they're here. They can do the career questions in the morning. And I want to make sure everybody gets to the boot camp this week. We're going to release some new tech content tonight. But if we're missing anything, I want to make sure we answer them. 
Milky, learn the cloud. It's all the same. Learn the cloud. Learn block storage, object storage, file storage, virtual machines, containers, firewalls, load balancers, VPN concentrators, BGP, VLANs, OSPF, software defined networking, NAT. Guess what? It's the same on all the cloud providers. So don't learn to drive a Honda, learn to drive a car. And if you do it the way we teach it, if you learn the functions by learning the network in the data center, you can work on AWS, GCP, or Azure at a moment's notice. So, you know, when I meet with a customer, I'm never going to mention anything that's got the word elastic cloud in front of it. Why? Because my customers are going to think I'm a sales rep for the company. And they're going to think I'm, I'm, I'm not fair and impartial, and I'm just trying to sell somebody else's stuff, and I don't have the customer's needs in their best mind. So what I'm going to do with my students, Milky, and this is the way we're going to do it, we're going to ask the customer, what is your desired goal? What is your desired innovation? The way innovators work, we make the end state of exactly what it's supposed to be. New workflows, new employees, new communications things. Then we figure out the technology that's going to make that end architecture possible. Virtual machines, containers, firewalls, load balancers. That's it. The tech. And then what do I do? I go to my handy dandy cheat sheet and say, oh, wait, I'm on AWS for my virtual machine. It's called the Elastic Compute Cloud. Oh, wait, I'm on Azure. It's called a virtual machine. I'm on Oracle. It's called a virtual machine. Oh, wait, I'm on Google. They made it called Compute Engine. So I just strip off all the silly names that all these marketing people did, pull all it off, design my architecture, and then I just fit it in. And I say, okay, guess what? I need a load balancer. Cloud load balancer, Google. Azure load balancer, Azure. Elastic load balancer and AWS. Same thing. Nothing changes. So the way we design is what gives us the solution. So Chris, if you want to bring in the next one. But if you're going to get certified in anything, it should be Google. I mean, it should be AWS or Azure. Um, and uh, there's that. Mid Hunnic Xavier, is it enough to learn Udemy, Stefan Mara courses? All I'm going to say is this. I interviewed a 1,000 AWS certified people that had taken courses on Udemy, as well as the guy that likes cats. And I love cats too. I couldn't find a single one that was hireable. They could all pass the exam. Those courses teach how to pass the exam. Excellent. Just like I could take you to a place and I could get you a copy of the exam and guarantee you can pass the exam. These courses are excellent at passing the exam, but you won't have the skills to get hired and nobody will be interested in what you have to say. So I'd say learn um, architecture, learn how architecture works, learn how to design the systems. And I have found no course on Udemy that was functional or usable at all. I started this company in response to seeing what those other courses were because they were quite simply the name of a service and how to configure it, which guess what? Is not what architects do anyway. So, you know, there's that. So I won't say anything about anybody's particular courses. It's not appropriate. There's lots of people working hard trying to do what they do. There's a big difference between getting certified and getting hired. I'm concerned that my people get hired, not just a paper certification that they hang on the wall. And that's why I take all the students from uh, all those courses that are out there that are certifying people, they get certified, they come to me, I start them back at ground zero, I teach them how to be a cloud architect and they get hired. So that's my perspective of it. Um, I won't say anything about anybody else's. Let's just say there's, I don't need to work at all. And I was totally retired, having a great time, charging 400 or $600 an hour to do career coaching. And when I saw the content that was produced, I just said I had to do something about it. And that's why I came out of retirement. And here's the reason why. I was training a really nice, fine young man, really good guy. His father said, could you teach my kid? So what did I do? I bought him the three top selling courses that were out there. Two were on Udemy and one was not purchasable via Udemy because the person that did it. And after three days, the, and I said, I said to him, I said, I will spend two to four hours with you every Friday, but I need you to do this in between me. Now, a couple of days passed and here was the most scary thing that happened. The kid, Nathan called me and he said, Mike, I set up an S3 bucket. I configured an EC2 instance. But then he said, what is it? And I said, what do you mean, what is it? He said, what is an EC2 instance? I said, you configured it, but don't know what it is. And he said, well, yeah, it wasn't covered in the course. So I watched all three courses. And literally speaking, no one explained what the tech is, how the tech works, or why it would use it. It was the name and how to configure it. Which if you are a configurer, like a junior implementation engineer, that's great. But if you're an architect, you need to know how it works. So my perspective is learn the cloud, learn how to design the cloud, become good at your job, and get cloud hired. So that's all I'm going to say.
can you advise the career path growth to achieve a cloud architect? Yes, please come to my um, how to get your first cloud architect job webinar. I will spend hours on this. But here's the thing, no buzzwords whatsoever. The second you use a buzzword on an interview, the hiring manager kicks you out. So the path to be a cloud architect is to learn the network, to learn the data center, to learn the cloud, then to develop your business acumen skills. And guess what? You need to know it. And after that, um, you need to develop your leadership skills. You need your emotional intelligence skills, your management skills. You need to develop enough business acumen to do ROI modeling, to be able to read financial statements and make impacts. You should know what top line revenue is. You should be able to determine whether somebody's weighted average cost of capital is cheaper um, than operational expenses because sometimes it's cheaper to buy something under OPEX than I mean under OPEX than it is to to deal with. I mean, under, I'm sorry. A lot of times it's cheaper to buy something with as a capital expense versus the cloud, which is an operational expense. And you need to be able to advise your client what's right for them based upon their business sake. So, here's my experience with getting people hired, regardless of their background. If someone's worked in tech. In about 16 weeks, I can get them to hired as a cloud architect. And if they've never worked in tech, I have to teach the network. I teach the data center, the business acumen, the leadership principles, the interviewing principles, the negotiation principles, and poof, they're getting hired and they're getting hired all the time. That is the thing. The key is knowing what the job is. The cloud engineer builds, the cloud engineer configures, the cloud engineer codes, the cloud engineer writes scripts. Cloud architects don't do any of that. So it's so easy to get these cloud architect jobs provided you develop the business, the communication, the leadership, the presence, the community, but it's all of that. People have it in their mind that this architect super technical. It's not. It's very leadership oriented. Now you have to have the technical knowledge to see the big picture and tie the pieces and parts together, but architecture is a team sport. See, when a customer asks me to design a system, here's what it's going to be like. I'm going to start with the CEO. I'm going to spend an hour with the CEO if I can get the time to find out what he wants. Then I'm going to go to the CFO, the CIO, the CTO. I'm going to find them what they want. Then I'm going to go to the VPs and ask them. Then I'm going to go to the directors and ask them. Then I'm going to even go and ask the engineers. And I'm going to probably bring in 50 engineers with me. And they're going to be asking questions and baselining systems. Then I'm going to go back and I'm going to design something. Then I'm going to go to write up a document, which could be 300 pages. By the time I'm done with pictures and charts and tables, I'm going to write an executive version of that document for the executive team. Then I'm going to schedule a meeting. I'm going to go present that back to them. I'm going to lead them back. I'm going to have another follow-up call with them. And once it's done, I'm out of there. So it's a matter of properly training for the career you want. And that's the path. The path is learn the network, learn the data center, learn the cloud, and develop those skills. And poof, you will be hired. And it's the best job ever. I mean, I mean, it is the best job ever. This cloud architect job is the best job ever. So I want you to get it. But that's why I'm being very honest with exactly what's necessary. Exactly, Wendy, you had a mock interview and they're mostly concerned with soft skills. Our students get hired all the time. Um, AWS hired two of our people recently that never worked in tech in their entire lives as solution architects. They are all concerned about attitude, energy, enthusiasm. I've asked thousands of hiring managers over the last 25 years. And I speak to thousands of recruiters every week, or at least I used to. And I speak to CEOs every week, the media every week. I speak to everybody. And what they're telling me is, I want someone that's got business acumen, soft skills, leadership skills. Stop sending us people that are coders. I want an architect to be an architect. They're like, every day I get software engineers, but I need an architect. I'm more concerned about their design skills, their soft skills, their leadership skills, and their willingness to learn. The rest of it, I don't care. But because everybody keeps going. So Wendy, I 100% agree with you. And my students get hired every single day. And Wendy, one day, 25 years ago, I was practicing internal medicine. Well, I'm not joking, internal medicine. Six months later, I was the lead architect on the most critical team at the world's largest internet service provider. Why? I had really good communication skills from practicing medicine. It was the soft skills that enabled me to do so much more, so much faster. Plus, I studied really hard, but that was the key. So, yes, totally agree. And that is everybody's concern. Soft skills, soft skills, and more soft skills and leadership skills and attitude. Because I can train skills. A company like AWS can spend $10,000 per person for dinner, and we'll do it. I've gone to dinners for work, and I actually, my first day in a big job, I've spent $10,000 on dinner for a small number of people. And I went to my manager, and like, what am I going to do? And he's like, oh, this is normal business. You're a lead architect. Expect it, um, that you've entered the big leagues. So that's why organizations are more concerned about that. 
Can you be a peer to the executive? Can you tell that executive that your billion dollar technology design is gonna generate $2 billion of business value? That's what an architect does. I do billion dollar designs all the time. It's just reality. And I, to even be able to see a billion dollar architecture, you gotta take a step back and really look at the big picture. So absolutely, Wendy, exactly. Rajesh, the non-tech folks. Um, two, well, two were in the last two weeks were hired as solutions architects. A lot of the non-tech folks also get technical account manager jobs because they're not really, they're kind of entry level. But the reality is, is most of my people are getting solution architect jobs at AWS, cloud architect jobs everywhere else, and they don't have any problem getting it. But they had the right skills for architect, the stuff that the companies want, not the stuff that the engineers are telling you need to learn. If they were working as architects, they would tell you. Raphael, honestly, I have students everywhere. So I have well over 200 students in Africa. I've got about 100 in Nigeria, about 75 in Cameroon, for example. I've got actually probably another 50 spread throughout Africa, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Uganda, Somalia, Morocco, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Benin, Gabon. I've got students all over India. I've got students all over Pakistan. I've got a tremendous number of students in Australia. I've got students in Asia. I've got students in every country you can think of in almost South America, almost of them. I've got students in Canada. The only place where we don't have students are in Antarctica right now. I don't have any Antarctica students, no. <laughs> but maybe we can get some penguins from our Antarctica because I'd really love that. Chris, do you want to bring in the next one? Cornells, what do I think about the AWS practitioner course? Ooh. So I'm going to give you two answers to this. There are times where I use that cloud practitioner and the rest of the time I, I recommend you stay far, 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 far away from it. So Cornelius, if you're living in the US and the UK or Canada or Australia or a rich country in Europe, I would say skip the cloud practitioner. Skip the cloud practitioner. Here's why. As a rule, employers don't find it attractive to anything other than sales reps. And the average cloud architect earns $600 a day. A good one earns $1,200 or much more than that per day. But the average earns $600. So if it takes the average person two months to do the cloud practitioner course, that's $12,000 lost per month, which is over the two months, is $24,000 lost. So we recommend people go straight to the associate, skip the practitioner, and then the professional. But if you are in a country where salaries are low and you're struggling financially and AWS, for example, is giving you a free voucher for this exam. For example, I have four, me and 49 of my students are volunteering in Cameroon right now. And we're working with some amazing people through my friend Samoa Shang. We also work with the World Fund Group. Um, and basically, we have a lot of our students that were given free vouchers for the AWS exam. So I have some of my students tutoring the people to do that. And my students are tutoring the people with the AWS cloud practitioner to really be solution architects in the first place. So they'll pass that cloud practitioner exam. And when they pass that cloud practitioner exam completely free, they're going to get 50% off the solution architect professional. And they're going to go straight from that cloud practitioner directly to the solution architect professional. So if you're in one of these environments where money is really tight and you're getting it free, then great. But if you're getting it free in the US, I recommend you skip taking it because getting it free in the US is still going to cost you two months time. Average person in two months lose $12,000 a month, $24,000. So a free $200 exam is much more expensive to you than $24,000. But if you're in a place where money is hard to come by, where it's almost impossible to even afford the exam in the first place, do that cloud practitioner course and get certified. And in the meantime, develop your business acumen, your communication skills, your leadership skills, your emotional intelligence, and your architecture, and be the best darn cloud architect you can be. And if that's the case, guess what? You'll get hired with the cloud practitioner too. It's not your certification. It's uh, the whole package. So keep that in your mind. I've got lots of students that have been hired by AWS and other places that have nothing other than networking certifications. I have people with just a certified solution architect associate. I've got cloud practitioners that are hired too. But as a rule, I like to say certified solution architect professional is the minimum, but not always. What kinds of problems would you solve as a solution architect? Well, it could be the organization's trying to look to increase revenue. They could have had some financial problems where they're looking to cut expenses, maybe employees, maybe automate. XBLMA, for example, if the minimum wage were to go up $10 an hour tomorrow, 
40 or 50 CEOs will be calling me, Mike, I need you to create some automation so we could do layoffs. Um, so if costs go up, you'll be there to remove people. To outsource, you're going to be doing that as an architect, for example. So if a law changes, for example, a new regulatory environment, the companies may need to change their technology instantly, and you're going to have to work around that. So that would be a common kind of problem that you would solve, for example. Um, what else would be another kind of problem? problem, problem the company needs to in sales. Okay, um, there's a, a pandemic, and all of a sudden, we're going to have a company with 200,000 people, and they need to work from home. How do you make that work? How do you keep that secure? How do you keep it locked down? That's the kind of thing we do. Company wants to start a new business. Okay, what kind of technology systems and make that business more successful? How can you increase sales? What can you do? Can we create a new process to do design and new simulate new technologies and new inventions to cost less than doing it? That's the kind of stuff we talk about. Heck, XBLMA. I actually did a consulting project for one hospital and I was really excited to go take care of this hospital's technology systems. This hospital had about a thousand nurses working and they were doing three hours of overtime each day. The fully loaded average salary of a nurse was $50. They had a thousand people that were doing three hours of overtime each day. So they were paying $225 per person for a thousand people every day. That was pretty darn expensive. When I sat there and because I'm an architect, the hospital said, we need help. So the first thing I did is I spoke to the CEO and then I spoke to the CTO and then I spoke to the CIO and then I spoke to the chief medical informatics officer and the chief nursing officer and I said, can I sit on one of your units and see what your people do? And they said, that's a great idea. Map it out. Do you know XBLMA when I was there? I'm looking for technology things. And I noticed the nurses were walking all day back and forth to an ice machine. And it was like, it was the most inopportune part of the thing. And then I said to the CEO, I said, and the chief nursing officer, I said, could we put some pedometers on the nurses so we can track what they're doing? Do you know we found that the average nurse was walking more than two miles a day going back and forth to the ice machine? So I went back to the CEO and the chief nursing officer, and they're like, Mike, what do you got for me? And I said, simplest fix ever. And they said, what's that? I said, we're going to stick a second ice machine on this. We're going to save two miles, which is going to save you at least an hour of overtime per nurse per day. And they were like, oh, my God. They're like, what's the cost of the solution? I said, $2,000. And they're like, Mike, we're expecting a couple hundred million dollar solution. I'm like, nope, this was a this was nothing. So it's really about that. Now that same CEO and chief nursing informatics officer said, Oh my God, Mike, you just saved us so money, much money. Can you now make our business better in another way? And I was like, sure. And I said, nurses on average spend 25% of their time looking for equipment. Do your nurses do that? And they said, Yes. I said, let's implement this RFID tagging system so you can find it. And I said, uh, what else is going on with your nurses? I said, do they run back and forth in the rooms to look at the telemetry to see a lot of artifacts? They're like, yeah, we do. I said, what if we can push that to a mobile phone? They're like, yeah, that's a solution. So in the end, those are the kind of problems we solve, but it's never about the tech. It's always about the business. Except for me who, who's got like these kind of switches and I've got 30 of these switches sitting in my house, but it's just one right next to me that I keep in case my students want to see what a fiber optic port looks like. I mean, it's crazy, but I'm a techie. I love tech, but our customers are not. Hey, Terry, Google selected me for the 12 week Google Cloud Associate Cloud Engineer Jumpstart program. Your goal is a solution architect. Will, you, will taking this program be useless to reach your goal? KT, I don't know. And here's the reason, K. Terry. What you find is the cloud providers are dealing with the following problem. We cloud architects are expensive. You know, there's good cloud architects earning four or $500,000 a year. There's medium cloud architects earning $300,000 a year, and the cloud architects that focus on tech are earning 180. So what AWS and Google are trying to do is they're trying to make the cloud architect a commodity. So what they're trying to do is provide vocational training that gives you just enough to be able to do the job, but not enough that they have to pay you a lot. So that's what these cloud, en these cloud engineer programs are. They're really teaching you how to be a tech instead of an engineer. So, is it a good training? Well, if you're not working right now, this could be the best thing ever. It really can be. But if you already have a good job and you're taking a pay cut to do this, don't expect to be a big pay rise after this because they're not covering the leadership, emotional intelligence, soft skills, business acumen. They're teaching you the lowest common denominator, which is the cheapest skills so they can make you a tech. So I teach my people how to earn the most, how to be promoted and have the best careers. And they're trying to teach you just enough to just be a junior engineer 
to configure stuff. Like at the phone company, so they don't have to pay the average person a lot. That's what they're trying to do. So um, if your goal is to be an architect, not a big help. If your goal is to be an implementation engineer, huge, huge help. But by being at Google for 12 weeks, it's still good training and it's free training, so it can't hurt. But remember the opportunity cost of your training. Time you spend in one place can't be spent somewhere else. So keep opportunity cost in mind. Chris, I think we can go for about three more minutes. You're a software engineer and currently working as an engineer, but you're certified in the SA, good. SAP, good. And DA, I don't know what the DA is. If that's developer associate, if you want to work in architecture, strip that developer associate off of your resume, it will crush you. I um, mean, that's what we have to do. Um, so what do you have to do, Najib? You've got that. You have to learn the network and the data center. After you learn the network and the data center, you need to learn the business acumen, the leadership, communication skills, emotional intelligence, presentation, um, ROI modeling, that kind of thing, CXO relevancy, and then you're going to get hired. But you've got to get that uh, DA off of your thing because that's going to make you look like a developer. The other thing is we don't like a lot of associate certifications because it looks it makes looks focused. We like professional and expert certifications only um, as a rule, and we like them focused. So you can definitely do it. You have to learn the architect, how to be an architect, but also get rid of that developer associate um, because it's going to make you look like a developer as opposed to a, uh, what do you call it? Um, a architect. Chris, I think we can do one more. All right. So that put me on the spot here. I have to pick. Yeah, all kinds of stuff. Having you find stuff by the minute, by the day, by the second. So for everybody, that's Chris. Uh, He's my chief operating officer. He is absolutely amazing, everyone. He's in there going through thousands, thousands of comments. You can't imagine how many are here. He's hey, amazing. Everybody. He keeps me online. He keeps me from getting things. And anybody right. that's asking the questions, can our certified solution architect associate course get him through the exam? Yes. Can our certified solution architect professional course get him through the exam? Yes. That's why we made them. All right. Here's our last question. Okay, so this is the best question you could possibly ask. Is the demand for architects increasing globally? Yes. So here's the key. Architects are not engineers. So does it matter where the cloud engineer lives? Absolutely not. If I'm running a business and I can get a great cloud engineer in India for $15 an hour or a great cloud engineer in Cameroon for $15 an hour or $20 an hour, guess what? I can hire a person that's hardworking, capable, and is willing to do anything legally to get the job done. And they're going to be real good at it. So, you know, there's people all over the world that are going to be in 20 and 30 and 40 and $50 an hour jobs that were previously earning a couple hundred dollars a month. So they're going to pick up the engineering jobs. And they're still going to get moderately good salaries because we still need people to do it. So instead of paying an American $200,000 or $180,000 to be a cloud engineer, you can pay someone in India $50,000 and they'll be really happy. Or someone in Nigeria $50,000 and they'll be ecstatic and live good because there's the, the arbitrage, the cost of living differences per country. So you're going to see your software engineering roles all outsourced in my mind. You're going to see all your engineering roles go. You're going to see all your DevOps engineering goes wrong throughout the world. So why are the architects not there? Well. You can't become an architect if you don't have business acumen. You can't become an architect without leadership skills. You can't become an architect without emotional intelligence. You can't be an architect without the ability to do the RO modeling. These skills that I'm talking about that we teach, these are very expensive skills. I spent a quarter of a million dollars on soft skills training. I'm not joking. Between Cisco and me, a quarter of a million dollars is spent on soft skills to learn it. And you know what? It paid for itself within 12 months because that's how the kind of impact it can have on your career. So Shaw. The issue is not that the architects are going away. The world's going to need more architects to design these big, enormously complicated systems. But they need to be able to go on site, to be able to talk to the person, to be able to be there and look a CEO in an eye and take that CEO for <coughs> steak, scotch, and lobster, because that's what we do, to entertain clients, to play golf with them. That's what we architects do. So that can't be replaced. But these engineering roles like DevOps and SysOp, that can be anywhere in the world, and that's what I think you're going to see. Further reduction of engineering salaries 
and further increases of the architect stars because that's what we're seeing. But it's a great question. Architects have to be able to go on site. Engineers, it doesn't matter, especially with the cloud. Okay, so I hope you all had fun today. I know we went into some things that are way, way, way outside of you know certified solution architect training, but I want you all to have the best cloud architect careers. And if you're looking for that solution architect job, cloud architect job or any of these things, I want you there. I want this to be the best year of your life. Let's kick off 2022 strong. Let's get AWS Solution Architect Associate Certified, Professional Certified. I've given you the ticket, the completely free book, the completely free course, and we're going to be here all day. Tonight and every night, Chris is going to be sending some labs out there. Go do these labs. Tomorrow morning at 0900, we're going to be out there, and we're or 9 o'clock. We're going to be out there answering your career questions. And then from 12 to 3, we'll be here and whatever you need to do. And if you want to be an architect, learning golf is not a bad idea. You're going to be using it, but you know, kind of keep those things in your mind. It's a very, very different skill set. Learning and learning golf would be much more appropriate than learning coding. So, to end the day, everybody type "cloud architect" hashtag "cloud architect" in the chat box. If you haven't hit the like button yet, please hit the like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, beep, 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 whatever you want to call it. I'm learning how to be a YouTube. I'm not a YouTuber, but I love YouTube. It enables us. And Make sure all- to hit the bell so that you are notified when I upload the lab videos. Excellent. And since we still have half of the group here, um, at the end, after you're done typing Cloud Architect, I want to know where you're all from. Because I think this is the, what I love about YouTube is that we can get people from all over the world. And I bet you we've got people in every country known to man. And it's so exciting to be out there, to be working with so many of you wonderful people. I love this chance. I want to make all of you the highest paid, best cloud architects in the entire world. So I want to do everything we possibly can do to help you. So I'm so thrilled that you're here, cloud architects. I want you to be very happy. Okay, Richardson's in Atlanta. Dan's in Cornwall, UK. I love this. Let's keep saying this is really exciting for me. Um, South Carolina. New York City, I like this. Uh, Zambia, oh, fantastic. London, UK. Richmond, Virginia, oh, this is great. Um, Denver, Colorado, Kevin, fantastic. Durham, North Carolina, place I love. India, oh, this is great. Keep going, Chris, I'm loving this. Somebody's up late. <laughs> Manchester, UK, that's where my family's from, somewhere along the line of that in Greece. Nebraska, oh, this is pretty exciting. Peru, oh my God, my, my, uh, Canada, love that. Um, Cayman Islands, I love those Cayman Islands. Leeds, UK, Raphael, fantastic. Nigeria, wonderful, welcome. Here we go, here we go. Rhode Island soon, uh, Rhode Island soon, South Florida. Welcome, James P3. All of us that were up there are now moving here for good reasons. Uh, Atlanta, Georgia, loving this. Hyperbat, India, this is exciting. London, UK, Atlanta. Nigeria, oh wow, you know, Nigeria is like the Silicon Valley of Africa. It's exciting to see. Austin, Texas, Zimbabwe, lots of growth going on in South Africa regions. Virginia, fantastic. Atlanta, Brandon, wow, it's great. Netherlands, Tom, um, so good to see you. Um, Nigeria, I know you're where you're at. So uh, South Africa, Mervin, I love that. I um, love that. Um, Nigeria, I love that. Uh, Bulgaria, wow. My family's from Greece, your neighbor, Toronto, loving it. North Carolina, this is so great. Um, Baton Rouge, I'm loving this, but I'm loving where these last names are. They're not from the US. Long Island, New York, Michigan, US. Oh, wow, this is so great. Ghana, welcome, Ghana. Um, Houston, Texas. Zambia, fantastic, Gabriel. Ghana again, oh, this is so exciting. Got a lot of sub-Saharan Africa here in New Jersey. Oh, fantastic. I'm from that. I lived there for years. Texas, great place. South Africa, fantastic. Zimbabwe, again, this is so wonderful. Minneapolis or Minnesota. Um, Guadalajara, Mexico, fantastic, Mr. Binary. Manchester, UK, this is just great. Australia, I love this. Ghana, again. Nigeria, again, this is so wonderful. Phoenix, LA. California, oh, this is just, you know, it's magic. Portsmouth, UK, I haven't been there in a while. Dean, UK. Are you in Wales, Dean? Uh, Sweden, uh, Mr. Singh. Uh, India again. Oh, my God. Ottawa, Canada. Canada. Um, Sacramento. Ernest is in the UK. 
Wow, um, South Africa, fantastic. Toronto, California, India. Wow, this is just so exciting. Philadelphia, that's where I went to school and grew up. Kenya, fantastic. Ghana, oh wow, so exciting. Originally from Nigeria, but uh, I could see that from your name. Uh, Robert Welsh is da in Dallas. Okay, Trinidad and Tobago, Ronnie. Fantastic. A Melbourne, either a Florida or Australia. A Wells, to be specific. That's what I thought because I saw um, Cardiff or something like that. Malaysia, fantastic. Um, UK, South Africa, Maryland. This is just so wonderful to get so many people. Um, UK again, uh, Bulgarian in Denmark, uh, Ivo Doikia, Ghana, Teddy, wow. Dara Lassie, Dara, what I would assume is Nigerian, but in Scotland, fantastic. Uh, Dasha in Toronto, wow. Um, Tampa, Florida, good for you. Um, hey, hey, there Chris we is go. over there in Tampa. I'm over here near Palm Beach in Port St. Lucie. Colchester, Joseph White, wow. San Jose, California. Benedict from Nigeria, wow, this is exciting. Teddy again from Ghana. So California. So the point is, is look at this wonderful Antarctica. Okay, Jazz. <laughs> so Jazz is actually in New Jersey. Jazz is one of my most amazing students. Um, and right there we've got. Hey, so I, from Scott. I just I just sent him there on a recruiting mission. So yeah. Okay, yeah. Wherever you send people on recruiting <laughs> missions, we're in a mission. Syria, Alberta. Wow, haven't been there in a long time. Uh, Sweden, I love it. Um, um, UK, uh, Maryland. So wow. In Toronto. Ooh, first one here. Italy. I think I saw somebody, somebody from Turkey earlier, which is a place that I've spent a lot of time in. Great place. Marla's in Atlanta from Detroit and London. Okay, so Spain, fantastic. I haven't been to Madrid in a while, but I loved it. Portugal, fantastic, Ronnie. Nikhil's in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is pretty. And uh, <laughs> yeah, Antarctica. Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to have one person there. Ottawa, Canada. Kishan, I went on a three-day trip to Ottawa, Canada that it turned into 12 weeks. Um, Patience is in Charlotte, and Kevin, Kevin is in Denver. Wow. And Joseph is in Nigeria as well. So, wow. A jacuzzi is in Nigeria and, uh, and Toronto. Wow. And Cameroon. Welcome. Um, um, Robert is in Pennsylvania. Roberto is in Pennsylvania. Um, and Dennis is in Kenya. God, this is so exciting. Um, Uruguay, fantastic. Um, Edinburgh, which is Scotland, loving that. Um, Tay Joss is in Philly. I know a lot about Philly. Um, Ahmed is in from Dallas, Texas. And thank you from Virginia. So Philippines, Lagos, Somalia. Wow, just like people from all over the world, Washington, D.C. I'm sure you'll be moving here too soon. Um, and uh, Nigeria, Philippines. Okay, really wonderful. So let's do this. Everyone, have a wonderful night. Every one of you, you guys are going to become great cloud architects and great solution architects. Have a wonderful night. We will be posting some lab videos later today. So please subscribe and hit the bell. And if you didn't hit the bell notification, please hit that bell. And that way you'll know when the video is going to drop and it's coming very soon. Because even everybody. though we architects don't configure, we still need to be able to know how to do it. So go out there, have a wonderful day. See you all tomorrow.